they will leave us in August um, with our thanks and appreciation. It's also the last board meeting before Sarah turns saint. And while Sarah hasn't been a member of the board, she's been very much with us over that time. And we have an opportunity to say thank you to Sarah tomorrow. But I do have to just say briefly, I recall when I joined the trust um, seven years ago, there was this uh, rather glamorous lady around the board table. And I didn't know who she was, but she did seem to be constantly on her telephone. <laughs> and I had to ask the previous, uh, well, the, the chief executive at the time, if this lady who was around the table had some sort of shopping addiction, <laughs> um, because she seemed glued to her telephone. So it was explained to me that we were very much in the 21st century and tweeting and uh, um, doing various other social media outreach in real time. Um, so it's been a real joy, Sarah, to have the benefit of your uh, support and the alignment you've maintained with the rest of the organisation um, by the um, innovative ways in which you have sought to make a connection between the board and the ward. Um, it's been very, uh, it's been, well, it's been pivotal um, in the engagements we've achieved with um, colleagues at the Trust, but it's also been uh, pivotal in opening the hospital up out of the patients and the community we serve. As I say, you speak every dialect of Chesterfield and consequently have made our um, communications accessible and always timely. And you leave us with great fondness, um, Sarah. But that's probably enough for now because you'll be getting plenty more tomorrow. Um, but we would like to um, mark this particular milestone uh, by saying a big thank you. Um, now, I don't believe we have any apologies. Is that correct? Are we back on? Apologies from Atul Patel. That's to attend to his mother who's been unwell. Do we have any other apologies? No, no we're all present. Correct. Very good. Um, so that brings us, if we may, to the board story. Um, we've got colleagues. I can see Andrea on the line. Um, do we have Hannah in person or? Um, Hello. On the call. Um, a very warm welcome to you both. Um, if you've had hot ears um, for the last, I don't know, 12 or 18 months, it's the great fondness with which you're both mentioned in dispatches by anybody in the trust I bump into in terms of the leadership you've shown through what has been an extraordinarily difficult time. Uh, so whilst we're on the subject of thanks and before you even uh, present your story, a big thank you from the board for all you have done and all your colleagues have done during this time. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Krishna if there's anything you want to say to introduce the item, please, Krishna. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I, I believe we've also got um, Hannah's sort of matron colleague, colleague on, on the line as well, sort of Natalie. So they're both matrons within critical care. And obviously Andrea's here as well, head of nursing. And um, the board story is particularly poignant because I think it does represent sort of um, how difficult a time it's been for all our patients, but actually the great work that some of our colleagues, especially on the critical care unit, have done to support the families during this time as well. So I won't take any sort of, uh, I don't really want to spend any more time. I'll hand over to both sort of Hannah and Natalie really, just to sort of take us through um, the story about Mr Ian King. Hello there. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you on behalf of me and Natalie um, for letting us have the opportunity to speak about Mr King's story. Um, so without further ado. Um, Mr King was admitted to critical care at Chesterfield Royal Hospital on, with COVID-19 on the 15th of February 2021, following a transfer from Kings Mill Hospital, where he had been an inpatient since the 3rd of February. He was transferred as a non-clinical transfer due to their bed pressures. This is established practice in which units seek mutual aid within critical care uh, bed network. Whilst on intensive care, Ian was sedated and mechanically ventilated, requiring high amounts of oxygen to support and support from the ventilator to breathe. Ian reminded, uh, sorry, Ian remained on increased respiratory and cardiovascular support 
for over a week and also had a tracheostomy tube inserted to aid ventilation on the 23rd of February. Following his tracheostomy, Ian's condition did not improve and he continued to require high levels of, ox uh, of respiratory support and sedation. During Ian's time in critical care, the team communicated honestly, openly and regularly with his family, taking the time to answer questions and provide clear explanations. Ian sadly passed away on the 2nd of March 2021 with his family present. The family were extremely grateful to the team for the care and treatment options provided for Ian and for the care and compassion also provided for the family. Ian's family all took the time to write letters of thanks and give their permission and gave their permission, sorry, for his story to be shared, particularly to senior members of the trust. Where, exper where patient experience was good and went well, we've got some bullet points here. So um, we showed continuous compassionate care provided by the entire critical care team. The family felt that they experienced significant acts of kindness throughout Ian's stay. Consistent communication with family members from around the world. I think I believe he had some family in Australia um, was provided at any time of day. Dignity and respect was considered at all times. Continuous review of treatment plans with modifications made to improve care was as needed. Honest and clear responses to family questions. Staff took the time to understand the family, their dynamics and respond appropriately. The chaplaincy um, service provided support for the family. Family spoke um, with their chaplain over the telephone and the chaplain actually came onto the unit with full PPE to deliver um, <clears throat> messages of, from the family and some prayers. And staff made sure that Mr King's wife was able to be with him at the end. Action taken from this was that the letter from the family was shared with the Trust Learning um, Forum that we have within the surgical division. Um, and the group found this to be a very compassionate letter and the praise and fantastic work carried out by Critical Care. We've also shared this with our entire team um, who remember Mr King and his family very fondly. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, it's lovely to hear the story of Mr King. And it's very moving to hear because I'm, I'm sitting here, as I'm sure many of my colleagues are, thinking about all the other uh, patients that we've been able to afford the same level of care to during this difficult time, despite all the barriers and constraints that uh, staff colleagues have had to deal with. So it's uh, it's lovely to have that extra extra mile that all our colleagues have gone to over this period uh, of time, uh, that reminder um, through the story of Mr King. And also, I think very suitable this week, given on Monday, uh, we gave thanks and reflected on um, the year we've all been through. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that and um, in, in thanking you for everything you've done for Mr King. I hope it conveys the sense of gratitude and appreciation of the board to all of your colleagues who have been so wonderful and magnificent um, in making sure patients and their families have been supported at what's been a really difficult time. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we've got Sue's hand up, please. Thank you, Helen. I just wanted to say that um, I'm so pleased that as a board we have this on our agenda. It's really important, I think, for us all to hear about what goes on in real life <laughs> um, in the hospital. Uh, it's And I think it's just a very helpful reminder of um, the great work that's going on um, with, you know, 
not just our patients but the patients families and i love the way that this story's brought that to life that we're looking after you know the the, the person and all of the things that surround them um so i just wanted to say thank you very much that was a really great read out of it um and um, a very very welcome agenda item a great reminder for all of us at board about why we're here actually so thank you yeah thank you sue and um, just seeing if we've got any other hands this closer quarters no not at the moment well i think oh chris chris sorry thank you Helen. <clears throat> i just wanted to i think the the story also represents the wider system working as well in the transfer of, of mr king from kingsmill hospital um so you know we've we've done this a lot and i think it, we've perhaps it's potentially gone unnoticed really that sort of where critical care units have been in difficulties you know and that included sort of the london hospitals and other hospitals having to decant more stable patients to create capacity in in larger units you know everywhere the critical care units and the networks have done exceedingly well over this time to make sure that the the critically ill patients across england have been you know suitably cared for in a unit near as near to them as possible and this is a, an, an example of that I think Mr King's sort of family recognised the, you know, above and beyond and just how fantastic the NHS is in being able to facilitate that. And the other thing I just wanted to draw out is, is the work of the chaplaincy. And um, I, I absolutely know that it, it's not been the same in other organisations, but for a chaplain to come in to work full PPE and, you know, Martin has actually done that throughout. So that's, that wasn't just a um, a recent thing. He's actually done that sort of to, to support the patients, the loved ones at a time of, of real need. That's been a consistent approach here at Chesterfield and very much valued by, by families and also the staff as well. And I think that was just worth bringing out because that hasn't been replicated in, in, in many organisations. So we're very, very fortunate to have the sort of the, the sort of Martin as our lead chaplain, really. I think we're really looking. Thanks, Krishna. Um, Jeremy. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for this story. It's very um, encouraging to hear about how well patients were looked after, even though the outcomes were obviously awful for many. What I'm wondering is, to what extent was this typical of the experience of COVID patients in ICU? Or, you know, God forbid, did you pick this out because it's a really good story and everything else is rubbish? Or did you pick this because it's an absolutely typical case of the um, hundreds, I think, of patients who went through ITU? So we picked this story because it was a very good representation of the care that all of our patients have received. Um, you know, we it shows the whole team from the support staff to the nursing staff to the doctors. Um, everybody just clubbed together throughout this whole um, last year, 18 months to to ensure that the care in such a difficult time was given to the highest standard throughout. I'm, I'm assuming, Jeremy, you asked that question for the purpose of clarification of others observing the meeting, not through any lack of trust or confidence. Yes. <laughs> as we've been delivering, so uh, thank you for helping us make that clear. I'm going to come to Andrea and then I come to Jane and Beverly. Thank you. So I was just going to add before that question that this this story is one of um, numerous um, stories that we had from patients and families about how amazing the care has been in critical care through through a really, really difficult and challenging year. And, you know, I just want to say how proud I am of the teams. Um, who've come together and looked after the patients so well and it's not just the teams in critical care it's been the wider trust as well because we've had significant support from other areas to enable us to be able to care for these really sick patients in the best way that we possibly could so it was just a big thank you not only to Nat and Hannah who know how brilliant they are um, but to everybody else who supported the teams as well through a really difficult time. Thank you very much. Um, so let's go to Jane next, please. Um, I just wanted to say what uh, we should be also be thanks to the staff. I recognise that this is a patient story, but um, these staff have had this experience time and time again, haven't they, through the period? And I know that we're doing everything we can to support our staff, but I 
think we just need to recognise the impact on staff as well. So they've given great care. I thought there's a personal cost to those staff as well. And we're doing quite a lot on beyond health and wellbeing of our staff. Uh, but also to recognise the work of the chaplaincy in supporting the staff as much as supporting patients and families, which um, I'm really pleased to hear um, that the work of the chaplaincy is managing to kind of keep pace with the, the burden of work that there's been. And I know that we've made a, re a significant investment into the chaplaincy service, and I think that's really, really important. So not just for patients, but also for families, and also very definitely for our staff who have that support as well. Thanks, Jane. Important term additions to our conversation so far. And Beverly. Really a similar point to Jane. I think for me, this this really articulates the additional emotion st emotional stress that our staff have gone through these past months. Um, and as Jane mentioned, we, we know there's lots of initiative to support staff, but just interesting to hear how to find morale and do you think as a board we're doing enough for the staff? Well, I'd, we'll put um, we'll put colleagues on notice of that question. We'll come back to it, and I'll just go to Hal, please, if I may. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add um, to Jeremy's question about whether this was kind of a typical patient, and certainly from the point of view of the compassion and the quality of care, then then it was entirely typical. But in one sense, it wasn't typical in the sense that the patient sadly died at at the end of their stay on ITU, and I just wanted to highlight to board that we've got um, uh, we've got national data, which is called the ICNARC data, which, which suggests that the clinical outcomes on ITU were actually better than nationally. So if you took a given group of patients um, with um, a degree of comorbidity, that our clinical outcomes were better and that higher percentages of our patients actually survived at the end of the ITU stay compared to nationally. And I think that's also we should remember that as a kind of um, credit to the really good, excellent clinical work that they've been doing alongside that that really compassionate and, and caring for the patient work as well. So I just wanted to highlight that to board. Beautifully put. Um, we've still got um, Zoe and Lee, so we're going to uh, going to uh, go on onto this item then. But in making a point, so would you also be kind of looking at Beverly's question, please? Shall I go first, Helen? Please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add, Andrew talked about how people from other teams had helped out in critical care, obviously, particularly during the peaks of the pandemic. And I guess I just want to share with the board how much positive feedback we've had from people about the welcome they've received when they've gone to critical care and the support they've had in there. Because, you know, if you've not worked in that kind of environment for a while or before, that can be quite scary. So I just wanted to say thank you to Hannah and Natalie and the team for that as well, because we heard a lot of positive feedback from people. Um, Thank you. And, and I guess um, in terms of Beverly's question, so I obviously talk a lot at board around the support that's available and at people committee. Um, and I, I would really like to hear that from sort of, you know, Hannah and Natalie and on behalf of the, the teams, really. I think I'd like them to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And um, so Lee, please. I, I think it's a really helpful story. And, and I think it really amplifies the phenomenon we kind of know about, about how the staff have had to step in to delivering that sort of psychosocial spiritual care whilst we haven't had the same degree of visiting and my, my question i think we're all kind of looking now for something good to come out of this experience it's a question for andrea and hannah really about because we've had to step into that more holistic caregiving could that be one of the benefits potentially out of the pandemic about how we sustain that broader support to <laughs> patients and visitors because because almost it it hasn't been a good experience, has it, in terms of patients not seeing friends and relatives during the pandemic, but perhaps because we've had to step into that space, one of the benefits could be how, how we've had to reconceive of more holistic caregiving, perhaps in the absence of those folk. And I just wondered how sustainable that was or wasn't, noting that it's been tiring. Thank you very much. We haven't heard from we haven't heard from Andrea. So Andrea, I wonder if you'd like to kind of maybe conclude the item for us. And um, Zoe's put down the challenge of all she's told us about at board about what we've been doing for colleagues. It'd be good to know from you whether or not your colleagues are feeling that, and um, and the point about what this approach to care going forward. Yeah. So. Um... 
in um, in kind of support of what Zoe said around the health and well-being, we've had an enormous amount of support on offer to all the teams across the whole of the trust. Um, in Andy Picking has been pivotal pivotal in kind of organising all the health and wellbeing sessions, not just the online stuff, but we've had, particularly for critical care, we put extra support in right at the very beginning in terms of the Ashgate sessions, um, drop-in sessions, one-to-one -one sessions, group sessions. And I think as we kind of came out of the pandemic as well, as we we're coming out, um, Hannah and Nat and the team have been able to do some kind of team working with, with the staff, some kind of restorative work, um, to kind of keep people well and healthy and happy and kind of grounded around what's happened as well because I think it has been an experience that none of us were expecting to have and it's been a difficult time but I think you know some of the staff that were wobbling as we've kind of started to come out um, after we've had these kind of time out sessions have really come together and, and actually gelled as a group and are actually you know looking forward to moving forwards if you like with the knowledge that we've had coming through the pandemic and using that in a really positive way to move forward so I think the you know the health and well-being um, on offer has been amazing absolutely amazing and I can't think what else we could have offered really because we've had everything that we've needed it's, it's been absolutely fantastic I think in terms of um, kind of the team around the patient approach that Lee's kind of described, that's definitely something that we're having a look at. Um, I think obviously all the bee nurses have now gone back to their own clinical areas and that is absolutely the right thing to do because the rest of the hospital is very busy as well. But we're certainly considering what other models of care can be delivered within the critical care area. So that is something that we're having a look at. Um, we've, we're in a fortunate position at the minute that we've been able to recruit a number of um, extra staff to critical care, um, whereas previously we might have had a few gaps. We're, we're inundated with people wanting to work in, in the units at the minute, so that's a really positive position to be in. But recognise that workforces do change, as uh, you know, and we have learned on the back of the pandemic. Hopefully that answers your questions. Does. And thank you, Andrea, for your leadership uh, during this period. Thank you so much, Hannah, for not only telling the story of Mr. King, but um, so ably representing the work of all your colleagues during this period. And I think in a minute, we should not only um, obviously extend our uh, condolences to the King family, uh, but our thanks and appreciation to colleagues. And also note the very important points that were made about the quality of clinical outcomes we've achieved during this period. Um, the thanks and appreciation for the chaplaincy service. I know for a fact on every day, the chaplain sees 27 patients, which I'm sure is um, a, a, you know, a big ask. And, um, and also the point that Krishna um, drew out that this is not only about Chesterfield responding in a good way, but Chesterfield playing its full part as a system player and working across um, systems into Sherwood, um, giving real life to the concept of provider collaboration. Um, so it's been lovely to see you and to hear from you. And thank you so much for your time this morning. I'm pleased to convey our thanks and appreciation to your colleagues in your workplace. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the next item now, if we may, please, uh, which is your report, Angie. Thanks, Helen, and perfect introduction from um, Anna and Andrea for me um, at this point in time. Really uh, challenging operationally for the Trust at the moment, um, as it is up and down the country, seeing record numbers of um, ambulance calls, uh, patients turning up at A&E, the demands of a vaccine programme being given um, out in primary care. Um, it really feels that the, the heat is back on. Um, and I uh, think just listening to Anna and, and Andrea again, a big thank you to um, our patients' family for taking the time to write in around something positive. Um, we've seen a rush of complaints coming back in in the last few weeks. Um, and the, the pressure that our staff are under um, will only intensify, I'm afraid to say, I, I believe, over the next weeks and months. So I think um, really poignant that we pause as a board to recognise and say thank you this week, especially to all our staff, um, and also that we keep that focus on the health and well-being of all our staff, um, not just as 
potentially we feel like we're coming out of a pandemic, but with rising cases again at the moment and imminent changes to lockdown, uncertainty about what it means for the way we operate in hospitals. And um, then I think that real focus for all of us to, to keep asking, are we doing okay? And how can we support our staff is gonna to need to continue for, for months, if not um, uh, years at the moment. Um, so my report really wanted to just keep focused on all the positive, amazing work we're doing and really looking forward. I can see Maria's just joined um, to our next item to, to really bring to life um, the annual report and strategy. It's not the next item in order. We're planning our agenda around our clinicians availability in, in perfect timing. David appears on screen. Um, so we're, we're going to pick up the annual report and how we've brought uh, annual plan, sorry, and how we brought that to life. Um, not only within our hospital, but across uh, across the system. And you'll see in my report a number of other examples of how we're celebrating the great work that uh, we have done and will want to, to continue to do going forward. Uh, the only other area I draw uh, attention to is um, all the system work. So uh, as you've heard me say a number of times, we are the system. Uh, Maria is not really leaving us. She is just doing a different role. Uh, so we, we continue to work um, with colleagues around what that means. Um, and you'll have seen that the um, bill did. Angie, you flipped onto mute. We can't hear you at the moment. Stuff his hands. <laughs> there's, a, there's a gremlin in the room, isn't there? None of us moved. When you start talking about legislation. <laughs> really strange. You well spotted. You listen to ICS conversations, aren't you? But um, uh, probably more, as Jeremy says, legislative conversations. Uh, but I was, just going to, I was just saying that the bill has been um, uh, put before Parliament, so the time frame for getting that uh, ICS legislative change is, uh, we're told, still on track for April next year. However, um, I feel we are working in a way that is moving towards that in joined up care Derbyshire anyway. Um, the challenge for us at the moment is how we do that dual running and exactly what it will mean next year. Uh, but they were the, the areas I wanted to draw attention to and happy to take questions, comments now or as we talk through some of the agenda items. Thank you very much, Angie. Um, does anybody have anything burning that doesn't come up on subsequent agenda items? Alison. Thanks, Helen. I just wanted to follow up uh, Angie's comment with my attendance at the Joined Up Care Derbyshire transition meetings. Um, and just to say that that assurance committee um, is receiving information on the transition arrangements and is aware of the, the slightly delay there has been in publication of the legislation um, but, and is having active reviews of the plans um, and asking the team, the Joined Up Care Derbyshire team, to prioritise what it needs to get done from a legal and legislative and financial point of view to enable the transition to take place um, and prioritise some activities that might need to slip past April next year. So just to update uh, board colleagues. Thank you, Alison. Uh, helpful uh, addition. Um, I think Angie will probably come to most of the other items as we go through the agenda. So thank you very much for that report. Um, and uh, should we move to item five? Please. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's move uh, to item five on your agendas, please. The annual planning update. And on that, if we may welcome some colleagues, um, Maria, Maria Riley, Claire Carson, David Shipston and Kate Linton. Um, and thank you for making time. I know you're all busy people. Uh, before you kick off, we should, of course, um, recognise that um, today will also be Maria's last attendance at uh, Chesterfield uh, Royal Hospital Board in her current capacity. Um, and just to say that we're so pleased not to lose you from the system. Um, you know, you, your, your reputation goes before you. The quality of your work is always superb. Um, the quality of your challenge to our thinking and your real desire to see us innovate and improve has been hugely pivotal in getting us a single and um, systematic approach to quality improvement. And we all know that all great organisations have just that. Um, and your role in bringing it to Chesterfield will be a legacy that will last long beyond your, uh, your, uh, 
your occupation of the office across the corridor. Um, and we look forward in uh, very much to uh, continuing to work with you in your system role. So you'll go with all our best wishes um, in that regard. And um, not around this table uh, for uh, not in a long time, or perhaps, perhaps yeah, a long time, uh, perhaps even the first outing for David Shipston and Kate Linton. David is consultant urologist, as is Kate. Um, and it's a great to hear your first hand um, testimony here today. So, Berenice, do you want to lead off? Thanks very much, Helen, and uh, and well said here here around uh, around Maria. Um, and it, what's great is that she absolutely will still link with this organisation and uh, steer the ship around uh, improvement and transformation, which is fantastic. Um, just to to further, Berenice, I've just realised that I've got Claire on my on my paper, but I can't see Claire on the screen. Is Claire Carson with us? Yes, she is. Claire, a very warm welcome to you too. We have the benefit of your fabulous attention to detail and your amazing approach to reporting, meeting in, meeting out without often seeing you. We can't see you today either, uh, but we're very pleased you're with us. So I um, certainly didn't mean to overlook uh, a warm welcome in that regard. So apologies, Veronique. No problem at all. Um, so I'm not going to say very much at all because the, the the team are going to do a presentation. So it's it's basically going to be led off. We've all received a paper in your packs around the, the operational planning update. And this is absolutely credit to uh, Maria Riley and Claire Carson, who've been instrumental in providing our information and our narrative around the plans that we want to take forward for this organisation. Very strange year. We've had we've done the first six months, um, and it's now about planning for the next six months. Uh, and Lee will come on later on to talk about some of the financial arrangements. Maria is going to take us through that, that that paper and just some key highlights. And then what we thought would be really valuable is if Claire can can just update how the the information and the work that that her and her team have done. Um, has really supported where we need to focus and highlighted for us where the improvements need to be. And she has done some fantastic work. It was presented at our informal board last month and very, very well received. And then finally, David, thank you for, for coming along as, as lead urologist and Kate Linton, who's also a, a urologist, but she is also our cancer lead. Um, just to bring some of that work to life and demonstrate some of the improvements that we've actually made related to the plans that we had in place. So I'll just hand swiftly over to Maria and thanks to the team for attending. Thank you, Berenice, and thank you for your kind words, Helen, but I'm not going anywhere. We are the system now and for the future. Um, so just stepping through the plan then. So um, as Berenice has said, it's a short term plan view with uh, six months up to the end of September, and we're still waiting for what planning might look like for the second half of the year. Um, it, it was really this time a truly system developed plan. Uh, it's the first time I've worked on one that ran in this way. We've taken the learning uh, and built on from our phase three planning into this process and it really did might work effectively as a whole system approach to planning this time. So the plan that you have um, is very long, um, but it describes how we are going to deliver the NHS priorities for 21-22 as a whole system. Just a couple of um, highlights. There is a real focus throughout it on recovery, restoration and transformation of service, as you would expect. Um, there are some very specifics in there around uh, access to the National Elective Recovery Fund, um, and that is based on uh, delivery of activity um, numbers, but also um, our transformational activities. Um, we submitted a compliant plan and so far we are on track to uh, deliver that compliance, both in terms of the activity numbers, but also in terms of the expected transformation. We saw yesterday our first self-assessment from NHS EI in terms of our May activity and there were a couple of, that was really positive actually how they'd assessed us, a couple of amber areas where we've got really robust evidence and they, we've already sent that back to them. So we're really positive about the action that we've been taking in delivery of the plan to date. Um, as Berenice said, the key challenge in trying to present to you a 107 page, 40,000 word document and bring that to life, what we decided to do was to focus in 
uh, on a couple of areas that are really important in delivery of the plan. The first is the how we do our restoration and recovery. Um, there's a real focus on our clinical prioritisation in uh, addressing long waiters and balancing long waits versus clinical priority, but also um, addressing health inequalities. And Claire's been doing some great work, which she's going to showcase you just one of the tools that she's been developing. And then um, underpinning all of the delivery throughout the plan um, is the brilliant work, um, the engagement of our clinicians. So David and Kate are going to talk you through how they effectively managed the, the urology service through wave two to place us really well for re restoration and recovery. Um, the improvement work they've delivered despite the challenges of COVID and, and the impact that's having. And then the really ambitious forward plans they've got for their service over the next 12 months. So I will show Share a slide set and hand over to Claire. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background, really, just so that I can kind of walk you through kind of the end result, I guess, of, of where we currently are now. So um, in terms of our current patients and on our waiting list, 4,840 patients, 97.5% of these have already got priority codes, as you can see um, along the right hand side. And these have been um, either added retrospectively or now at this point are added as, the, as they're put on the waiting list. So as clinicians are, are actually adding patients to the waiting list, they're actually putting them against a priority based on what the patient's clinical need is. On the right hand side table, you can see our waiting times that split into the priorities and also you can see our average waiting times in terms of what the current waiting time is and also what the average clearance time. So when we talk about the average clearance time, what we mean, what we mean by that is the current activity that we are delivering each week against the current number of patients that are on the waiting list in those priority orders. Um, so as you can see from this, it's a very high level summary and I, I think you can kind of pick the messages up from there in terms of looking at our priorities and um, the priority twos and the updates and the backlog that we've currently got there. So currently on our priority twos, we've got 255 patients that are over eight weeks that we've categorised as, as, as our priority twos that we know should be dealt with within one month. So this is an eye level summary and what it doesn't show you is the high risk patients or patients um, that need to be reviewed, that have got long waits on there um, and also that have got underlying health conditions. So to do this is a real big task and also um, the other thing to remember is as well that we're expecting our clinicians to continually keep revalidating these patients once they're over their expected dates. So if you've put somebody on a waiting list and a priority three that needs to be done within three months, that has to be revalidated if that patient has not been seen within, within three months. Next slide, Maria. Thank you. Um, so this all started after um, Krishna invited me onto a national call um, to watch a demo of a system that risk stratified the waiting list. Um, the professor delivering the presentation called it his sausage machine. Um, so that's something that I've kind of continued through this. Um, it was very complex. Um, it had millions of outcomes in there um, and um, it potentially could have been very expensive. And I do think that that is still being looked at nationally. But I did go away thinking, well, OK, then what can we do locally on a smaller scale? Um, so using some of the tools that we've already got, um, so thinking about we've already got our waiting list, patients are already listed on there with their operation codes, we've already got comorbidities of our patients that are known to us, so patients that are actually known to us within our past system have comorbidities recorded against them and that's stored within the system. And then we've also got the national group here, which has got an hierarchy table in there that categorises the comorbidities for patients and operations, and it actually scores them. So using all of this, and I won't bore you with any more of the detail of that, patients are given a score that is based on their known comorbidities and the operation um, they've been listed for. So um, this is the outcome, basically. So this is our very own sausage machine. And what this provides us with is a, a view of long 
um, of how long patients have been waiting, which is the bottom axis of the number of days that patients have been waiting. And also on the left side, that gives us the risk rate of our patients. And then you can also see the cross, which provides you with a medium for each of those. And you can select by um, priority. So in terms of you can flick through your priorities of the patients of how they've been categorised on the waiting list. You can look by consultant and you can also select by um, specialty um, and their actual waiting list that they've been added to. And each of the circles represents a patient. And if you hover over the circle, of the circle, what it provides you with is the patient's details. So it actually gives you the hospital number of the patients, which we've obviously anonymised for, for this purpose. It gives you the number of patients, uh, the number of days, sorry, that the patient's been waiting, which on this one is 636 days, which is 91 weeks. The median of waiting time at the moment is set at 14 weeks. And then it also gives you the risk score for that patient, which is 144, and the median risk score is currently sat at 50. It then gives you the list of comorbidities and obviously the procedure that the patient's been listed for. So it's a bit of a guide, really, for the clinicians, rather than continually having to keep pulling notes constantly to review these patients. This was an idea of them being able to log on to here and look at their patients that are on the waiting list so that they've got an idea of where to go next. And obviously your top right is the, is the high risk, long way to patients where you'd, you'd kind of start to, to look at some of these. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, if I move on, uh, can I bring in David, please? Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Hi. Yeah, you can hear me, good. Right, I'll be brief. Um, um, so, in retrospect, it was just all the three C's, cooperation, communication and common sense. At the time, it did seem a bit more difficult than that. Um, the challenge we had was to continue uh, a, a service for essential and urgent patients in the constraints of being a very procedure based uh, specialty with one clinic room and already on the risk register inadequate change facilities for patients, which we we're going to have to socially distance and therefore slow down the flow of patients through the department. Uh, so what we did again is just common sense. We we had expert triage, so patients referred would have a sort of consultant or senior clinician triage them to get the right patients to the right place at the right time. Um, and then I introduced some what I called hybrid clinics. So instead of seeing one patient every 25 minutes and a clinician sitting around twiddling their fingers for 10 minutes whilst uh, the, the the place is cleaned up, we we we, we did procedures interspersed with telephone clinics so it kept us busy um i did quite a few of those clinics because i'm quite good at high turnover stuff um and the people we had a, a locum that was quite slow turnover so we'd move people around so everyone was doing what they were best at doing um and we managed to get you know keep 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 us busy get through quite a few patients that way um the other thing we we set up was the hybrid mdt meeting um so it and uh, came and helped with that. Initially, <laughs> we, did, we had quite a few meetings using mobile phones and hand signals when the sound went off, but uh, I think we've come a long way since there. And the fact that I'm currently popping into this meeting, I will be contributing to our MDT meeting this lunchtime. And I'm actually doing a telephone clinic all from home because I'm socially distancing, uh, having had a COVID contact, I think just speaks volumes of how far we've actually, actually come. Um, so if the next slide, please, and I'll be that's my last slide. No, almost my last slide. Um, the that that describes really the front end of the patient pathway, seeing them in clinic. Uh, some of our patients, of course, need operations. Challenge there was half the theatres were being used for ITU and half the anaesthetists were uh, either sleeping or in the hospital on on call. So we had a vast reduction of theatre capacity. Um, so I basically the top three things I just had to go through the whole waiting list of 400 patients, give everyone a priority code um, and um, find those patients who might be served with a different manner rather general anesthetic procedures and cystoscopies because um, I don't want to go into clinical details but some things may may be done under general in some circumstances when you've got COVID around you might want to try it under local anesthetic although the results might not be as good I, I, we don't need to go into the details of all that um, and then having set up this rank order list of patients who needed operating in what in which priority order, it was then all down to uh, an amazing team of uh, pre-assessment nurses, anaesthetists and, and admin team, all of us in communication, you know, answering our emails every 
30 minutes with queries to actually get the theatre capacity that we actually had full and uh, and have no one day cancellations and get through things. Um, in terms of the long waiters, we managed to uh, keep a few, uh, keep clear quite a lot of those uh, by doing a list at Balborough, uh, myself and uh, uh, a retired anaesthetist who was very fast. We managed to get through a lot of a lot of patients on a high turnover list. So it's really all about communication, work and flexibility. Um, is there any evidence that we made any difference? Well, the next slide um, really shows that our, on the 23rd of 21st of March, our P2 clearance rates were very favourable, like one and a half weeks to get patients done, which which was really good compared to other urologists. And the next slide, which is much better because Claire Carson made this slide and she's very good at them, um, really shows from how from January to June, our P2 waiting list was quite long and diverse and we've managed to contract it uh, right down. Um, so that's the end of me. And I, all I can say is it, it, what we did was just 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 new ways of working with amazing teams who were, were very keen to help and uh, be flexible. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I'll uh, ask Kate to come in, please. OK, thank you. Uh, can someone give me a thumbs up to let me know that they can hear me? Perfect. Lovely. Thank you. So as you are aware, um, urology pathways have been one of the most challenged through the pandemic. And that's certainly been true of the prostate cancer pathway. As you know, we're mandated to diagnose uh, prostate cancer patients within 28 days. And that's been a real challenge through the pandemic uh, for a number of reasons, social distancing. Patients have been um, unwilling and unkeen to come to the hospital for a prostate biopsy until they were vaccinated because prostate biopsy as in trans rectal prostate biopsy there is a risk of sepsis and if those patients are admitted during the peak of the pandemic there's a risk of covid transmission so patients were reticent to come for a prostate biopsy transrectally during that time so we realized that we had issues and we engaged all stakeholders uh, to a meeting on the 22nd of april where we process mapped the pathway and looked for solutions for each of the different steps in the pathway. So how can we speed up the pathway? How can we reduce the time between each step? So this first data, and thanks to Claire Carson again for um, providing um, such lovely slides. This is where we were at before that meeting on the 22nd of April. So as you can see, we're mandated 75% uh, um, to uh, diagnose patients within 28 days, so the 28 day faster diagnosis uh, standard. And at that time, 64, so nearly 65% of patients were being diagnosed within 28 days. And as you can see, the pink um, spots down the bottom, uh, that there were significant numbers of patients who were waiting more than 10 days over that 28 day standard. Um, next slide, please. So this is now data from May. So this is the month after we had that meeting with all stakeholders. And actually, you can see that although the number of patients diagnosed within 28 days is not much different, so six, about 65 and we've got 61 percent, I would say that's within common cause variation. So the natural ups and downs, peaks and troughs that you will get in that kind of data. So essentially very similar. And again, similar numbers of patients in the pink spots down the bottom. Um, waiting uh, up to five days more, up to 10 days more, or more than 10 days. So next slide, please. Thank you. So these two uh, data slides are the most important ones because they show the great work that our assistant service manager, Nicole, and our um, a navigator, uh, Laura, uh, did some fantastic work and have really made a difference for patients. So before that meeting in April, you can see that uh, so down the bottom in the pink squares is the number of days between each, each of the different steps within the pathway with the pink circle at the bottom right so showing that the average wait for patients along that pathway was 76 days so a far cry from the from uh, where we should be um, and if you look if we look at the time from telephone to biopsy so the 33 days um, square. So I'd ask you to keep that in your mind as we move to the next slide, please. 
So this is now June, this is validated data, and this shows the great work that Nicole and Laura and others, but particularly them, have done. So we can see that our average has come down from 76 days down to 35 days. So we're still not quite at our 28 days, but we have more than halved the pathway with the great work that they've done. Um, and if you look to where, um, so where the pink box that was 33 days, it's now nine days. So the time from the telephone call to the biopsy. So we have made at all steps in the, in the pathway significant reductions in the amount of time that patients are waiting and we've more than halved the pathway. Yes, we're not at the 75% for the 28 day for FDS, but we're getting there. So I see this, that we've made some great steps in this pathway. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my final slide. So ways that we are um, innovating and improving and developing services. So through the pandemic, I've already told you, patients didn't want to come for transrectal prostate biopsies because of the risk of sepsis. So we have moved to a local anaesthetic transperineal biopsy. So this is something that is uh, nationally led. Um, Derby are looking to do it, and I've actually been chatting to them about how we've implemented it, how we've implemented it. So we are now doing prostate biopsies in many patients, local anaesthetic, transperineal, so a tenfold reduction in the risk of sepsis. And we can now target all of the prostate as opposed to just round the back from the old way we used to do our biopsies. This is a major uh, way forward. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that we're doing this. And, uh, and yet we've been doing this for a couple of months. We're also um, working in conjunction with uh, South Yorkshire and Bassett Law Cancer Alliance. So patients who have radiotherapy for prostate cancer do get significant or can get significant rectal toxicity. So they can get lots of rectal symptoms from the radiotherapy. And we are going to, from the 28th of July, start to put in a rectal spacer, so a hydrogel rectal spacer, which moves the prostate and rectal wall um, away from each other to reduce that toxicity. Um, this has been, this is an early implementation um, project and the first 40 patients, we've actually received funding from South Yorkshire Bassett Law Cancer Alliance to help us run this on uh, behalf of the Alliance um, to get some data on this and perhaps then move it out to the rest of South, Shor South Yorkshire Cancer Alliance. Um, we've put in uh, a bid, so as you're aware, we've, um, so rapid diagnostic concept, we're, there's been an accelerator bid and we've put in uh, the idea to have nurse-led community um, hematuria clinics. Um, so a, an innovative way of working, using our workforce differently um, and in a different setting um, to increase capacity and improve um, the experience for patients. Um, a potential idea uh, using the community diagnostic hubs would be potentially nurse-led community UTI clinics. And we're developing our workforce. So we have a trainee nurse consultant and we've got some shared consultant posts with uh, STH. And we've rolled out remote monitoring, so personalised stratified follow-up for some prostate cancer patients. Now, I've also come with an ask. We've done some great work uh, and it's great. And thank you so much for the opportunity to showcase that and to tell you. But I've also come with an ask. Our urology department is um, small. We could do a whole lot more work um, if we had a bigger physical footprint, which we desperately need to, um, to deliver a better uh, service for our patients. So I just really ask that um, if you can help us with that, um, we really do need a bigger physical footprint within the trust. And then I'd like to just give thanks. Um, I've already made it clear that Nicole and Laura really helped. The care unit have supported us in our vision and, uh, and obviously Matron CNS team, the Cancer Pathway team, instrumental in the work we've done and the Cancer Improvement team. So thank you. 
Thank you, Kate and David, and, and thank you to Claire. Um, I hope um, I hope that demonstrates the, the brilliant work that our clinicians are doing. What David didn't tell you is that at the end of uh, wave two in recovery, we were asked by NHS EI to comment on how we've managed to deliver um, a very different um, out, out turn in terms of our, our, our surgical waiting list for urology versus the, the rest of the Midlands and our peer trusts. Thank you very much. Goodness me, um, yeah, it's been extraordinary, simply extraordinary to hear what you've done. Um, I was very struck by David saying we've done nothing other than communicate, cooperate and use common sense. And I would say back to you, never has that recipe required so much of so many people, but to such good effect. Um, and I think as a district general hospital, it can be really difficult with the various um, requests that um, are put on us on a daily basis to take a step sufficiently back from all of it to bring our intelligence and our experience and our determination to be leading edge to bear in um, making sure that we get the best possible clinical outcomes for our patients. And I think that was just the most extraordinary example of us doing just that. And not only to hear it brought to life about the urology pathway and particularly for uh, prostate cancers, but the graph Claire gave us about the absolute assurance we can have that we're doing our very best. And Claire referred to the sausage machine. And I think the sausage machine merely conveyed the intensity of the work that's going into this. It certainly doesn't convey the bespoke, um, risk-sensitive, patient-centric approach that's being taken here, which again is, you know, phenomenal. Um, we can't thank you enough. Uh, Humbly. Um, Berenice. Thanks, Helen. I, I just wanted to kind of finish off with a with a couple of comments. Thank you very much to the team for presenting that. It, it, I mean, I think everybody will say, you know, it was excellent. Um, you, you heard a few times through through that presentation. A uh, thanks to Claire for um, providing the information, and it's just to to highlight two things. One, the quality of the data and the information. Angie and I go to a lot of system meetings. Um, and the, the data is often challenged back at those meetings. The quality that comes out of Claire and her team is exceptional and, and we don't need to have those challenges, which is really helpful because um, it, it, it kind of helps you provide a true, honest picture and you're doing what you, you, you know your business. But also the way that she manages to present it in a format that is so easily readable as well. Um, we, we, we've just had our finance and uh, performance meeting some information on the emergency department. And again, uh, we got great thanks for how that was presented. And the second bit is just to say, you know, a massive thanks to the clinical teams. They, when they were asked to do this, uh, their response was, well, this is, we're just doing our job. I, we've got nothing special to really share with us. But you can absolutely see from this that the clearance times that we've been able to achieve and implement new improvement ideas, working with the Royal Academy of Improvement, um, has kept us going and kept us on the map. And you can see that they've, they've worked extremely hard throughout this whole process. So just wanted to highlight that and say a massive thanks to the team. Clock the ask for the um, estates issue. We had the, the estates meeting on Monday, uh, Kate, and I will highlight it again to your divisional team because it is definitely not on the capital plan despite asking. So we'll make sure that's fed back. Thank you. Angie. And, and just to add uh, my thanks, absolutely fabulous. And um, I want to make sure we really share. I too picked up Helen. I love the way that Claire says so. Uh, and I just went off and did my own sausage machine. Um, and David said, oh, it was just common sense. Um, none of it is just, believe me, when you hear what's happening in other systems and around the place. So please take a moment to take the thanks and, and the credit. And what Claire didn't tell you was how much the professor was going to charge for um, each patient for that data. Though I do seriously keep saying it. We need to think about how we share this um, model, Claire, and get the money because she can pay for case refurbishment. Then. But, uh, Thank you all. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, Jane, and then I come to Sue. 
Um, I just wish you could see my smile. Unfortunately, you can't for the mask, but um, as chair of Quality Assurance Committee, we've been asking lots of questions about how we know the impact of COVID on our patients, not just our cancer patients, but our whole cohort of patients. And we've, we've perhaps been asking that question for several months and we've really sort of struggled and how to crystallise that and we've tried all sorts of things, but actually what I've seen this morning is just simply amazing. And I just wanted to add the facts from, from me as Chair of Quality Assurance Committee, actually, because you have absolutely responded to the questions that we've asked about how do we know our patients aren't being further harmed by delays, etc. So well done, well done to the clinicians in terms of transformation, but well, absolutely well done, Claire. Um, your work is amazing, and I for one was one of the people that was cheering your infographics at the Finance Committee. So uh, thank you. Uh, uh, that's beautifully put, Jane. And to add to that, I've actually sent Angie a text during that presentation to say I'd like to give you a high five. Because if Angie had a pound for every time I've asked her about how it is we're going to bring some intelligence to bear on our recovery, she'd be a very rich woman. She'd probably be on her own yacht somewhere in the Caribbean. Um, but just to see it um, demonstrated in that way is just, uh, it's a great, a great comfort to the Quality Committee, but to the board, and I'm sure to uh, patients and the community about the handle we've got in all of this. So, Thanks, Helen. I'm probably not going to say anything new because we're obviously all equally delighted, but I just want to point out when David said a few times, it's just common sense. The trouble with common sense is it's not that common. Um, and I think what I love about what's happened here is you've obviously used a lot of uh, your experience and wisdom to do that prioritisation of, of the patients. Um, but what I love about it from a Chesterfield point of view, I think what our USP is, is that we didn't stop there. We then got the skills of Claire and her team to say, well, how do we automate this? How do we make this happen so that we can use that? And, uh, you know, and then you've now got that live dashboard now to, for prioritising patients. So, I mean, there's two bits of genius, but to put the two bits together in real time uh, is just fantastic. And lots of organisations would have missed that. They would have just gone, brilliant, you've done some prioritisation work over the weekend, good job. We've taken it. And I think it's testament. I just wanted to make the point that We've been uh, looking at and supporting Royal Academy for a long time before I joined with LIA and then CUSA and Royal Academy. And I think that some of these things that we're now seeing as real examples are, you know, it being beautifully brought to life about that capability that we're now getting as is just systemic in the organisation. And it's, as Angie said, it is unique um, and we shouldn't forget to celebrate it. And I love all the data. Um, I just had one question, um, which probably of Kate, I think. On your last slide, you talked about some of the other things that are coming up. Um, some of them made me slightly squeamish, but the, the spacing tool, which sounds very clever. Um, where are those ideas coming from? Is that through the process improvement mapping that you're doing? Is that coming from the clinicians? Where are those extra ideas for improvement coming from? Um, so a variety of areas. Um, so a couple came out of my head. Um, but, you know, other people will be doing them and just, you know, I've kind of thought, well, actually, we could do this. Okay. Um, some of them are so the sp spacer. Um, so that's come from our oncologist and that's come from data showing um, high levels of rectal toxicity at Sheffield. And so he's um, kind of said, look, want to do this. And um and so, you know, and, and so I and others have said, yes, let's do it. Let's let's try and implement this. Um, so a variety of places. Thank you. And I think, yeah, my final point really was um, data, 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 data. So, I mean, we all love Claire and her fantastic abilities, but it, it drives everything, doesn't it? And I know the, the team under Maria have said that to me in one of the previous sessions was we just the data has to drive what we do. So it's so encouraging to see this. Um, so thank you all. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to draw a line there, uh, conscious of the time. Um, Maria, Claire, David, Kate, a huge thank you. But I think the final word of thanks needs to go to Berenice. Um, this is an example, uh, if one was needed, of a chief operating officer getting to grips with what is going to be our greatest challenge in the period of recovery uh, post and um, through COVID. Um, and we're very grateful to you, Berenice. Um, so it's, um, yeah. It's a big thank you all round. Very well done.
Um, so my suggestion is, given the amount of time we have taken, we've used an hour and 10 minutes on two presentations. I'm going to just to keep going on the agenda because I'm going to use item four as all the presenters from all the presenters right for our board members. So we'd be able to cut our cloth as, uh, as it's required as we get to the end of the meeting. Um, for any rapid exchanges we need to wrap that, but I want to do full justice to um, to uh, the other items and uh, to keep along with them. Um, so let's get on, if we may, please, to item six, together as one strategy. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and again, team effort. So thank you uh, to colleagues. Maria's just dropped off, but thank you to her for supporting us, um, hopefully with the last leg now of our uh, five year strategy. What we've done since the last discussion at board is um, review those strategic objectives in the five year context um, and aim to reflect listening to our conversation a couple of months ago, the level of ambition when it was interesting when we looked back um, when we wrote those words back in January, February, but then taking a step back and, and thinking actually we haven't maybe got some of that wording right. I haven't tracked all the changes because I found it useful to look at it cold again. So hopefully board colleagues, when they look at those high level ones, um, will be able to give us any final feedback on have we really reflected that level of ambition without pinning ourselves down in a five year strategy that everyone will turn around in two years time and say, really. What we've done at the same time is then um, do the annual planning process that supports year one of that journey towards those five year ambitions and used all the work, some of which perfect technical as you've heard today, each of the divisional teams and corporate teams have built up for their annual plan. Um, and as, again, you've already heard this year's annual plan has been a bit of a strange one. Um, so there's a real combination in there of um, trying to pull together the aggregate at trust level of what steps we'll take this year, making them smart, which was a bit of a challenge for us. And behind all those, there is still some very detailed uh, and I think urology, uh, you can imagine their detailed plan that then contributes to this um, trust board annual plan that then contributes to the five year one. So hopefully we've captured it in a way that does that. Um, I did have a moment where Helen, Helen asked me last week and said, are you happy with it? And I said, yes, I'm closing it and not looking at it again because I'm not happy every time someone somewhere nationally comes out and said, now we're giving you a new target on this or a new target <laughs> on that. I feel the need to go and rewrite it each time. So uh, with all these things, they're never perfect and they're never done, are they? But I hope the current version gives us enough to, to be able to measure our success um, and track our journey on that, that five year plan. Splendid, thank you, Angie. So uh, we've got um, a request to approve the um, objectives as I hired for 2021 as the first year step towards the 21-26 uh, journey. Um, with the context Angie has just given us. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions or raise any issues in advance of making that decision? Well trailed, yes. well socialised, <laughs> well done. That's my first celebration of the day, hopefully. I'm looking forward to a few more later. <laughs> Very good. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a big exercise and I mean, we said it on previous occasions when we consider the strategy, um, Angie, but you know, having persevered with preparing the strategy in the period of COVID, I think shows great maturity um, in the executive team and the board. It's not so easy, isn't it, for everybody to be running around doing the same things, whereas actually at a time of crisis and challenge, leaders need to lead out and the act of preparing the strategy was leading out. Um, so very well done. Um, now, going to go on to item seven, which is again, this is on a this is on a, a, a recurrent visit to board uh, and hopefully for us to have a good discussion today. Item seven, the trust fundraising strategy and policy. Uh, floor is yours, Lee. I, I, I hadn't intend to speak to a long for a long time on this, Helen. I think we're in a reasonable place now in terms of the work we've galvanized around in terms of charity brand, suitably named mascot, present in the foyer for when we get patient footfall back in, in the organisation. And we previously didn't have a very 
targeted and dedicated strategy about how do we differentiate between fundraising for our own charity versus more generic fundraising activity in the trust. I think this strikes a bit of a balance between how we go about doing that in terms of supporting some national fundraising endeavour, but also being quite conscious that we want to get a bit slicker at fundraising to add additional value for ourselves and the charity. But I'm, I'm happy to take further comments on the paper, but I hadn't intended to speak for very long. But I, if Atul were here, he may have said something and Beverly may want to contribute slightly in, in the context of Charity Funds Committee. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Beverly, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think this is well rehearsed. It's been to the board before, and it's actually very timely with the launch of the appeal for the staff health and wellbeing. Group. So I think the staff needs some clarity. I think we could put more effort into comms to the staff. And the charity is actually cross-charged for comms work. So I think we need to make sure that we really drive that now and staff recognise the, the value that the charity brings. I mean, some years we've put a million pounds back into the trust. And that represents dozens, if not hundreds, of projects that staff have brought to us. So it's a fantastic tool, tool for staff engagement. So no, we welcome this now. Um, and again, as uh, Lee said, trying to strike the right balance between recognising that giving is a very personal decision, uh, but at the same token, being able to draw people's attention um, to the good work that um, our own charity does in terms of patients and staff. Uh, Keith. Thank you, Helen. It wasn't specific about the report. It was more just in relation to the charity piece. I noted yesterday when Angie and I are out doing our ward visit, and it's come up more than once before, um, that people are very keen to make applications to the charity for various requests and various uh, funding pieces. But what seems to sometimes get in the way is the fact they have to provide a report and do work and, and fill in documentation to do that, which I absolutely understand. I wonder if there's a challenge to us, is that documentation perhaps as light as it could be? And do we benefit, do we detract in some respects from people being able to make those applications because of the time it takes, given how busy they are, to be able to do that? I wonder if it, there is a way of making that as light as possible for people in the organisation was my challenge. Um, let us give that challenge to the Charitable Funds Committee. Um, I'm sure it's, you know, I'm sure it's something you review periodically. Um, and I know you've done a lot of work to kind of delegate decision making and budgets. Uh, but, you know, if we could ask you just to take an action to take stock, that would be appreciated. And um, so can I take it on that basis that colleagues are happy to approve the strategy and policy? Yeah, thank you very much. And that brings us on to the next section, learning, improvement and innovation, albeit we've had lots of that already today. Uh, but in item eight, we're going to look at seven day service update. Um, all yours, Al. Um, thank, thank you. Um, apologies if I keep glancing to the right. That's because I've got the papers on a different screen. Um, so the, this was um, a request from board to update us uh, um, all about where we were with seven day services. This was following on from um, just prior to COVID um, board uh, or, or just at the very beginning of COVID board approved um, some extra financial resource in order to try to help us um, with um, compliance with national standards because we were repeatedly falling short with um, compliance, particularly around two items. One was um, time to consultant review where there's a, a standard that 90% of patients should be seen within 14 hours of admission to hospital. And the second one that we were falling short on was um, seven day um, consultant review so that, that patients where, where appropriate were being seen on a seven daily basis, again, by a consultant. Um, we um, noted that there was a shortfall in our ability to do that because of um, consultant numbers, particularly around acute care consultants. Um, related to that, um, board agreed that we should invest in some extra consultants because the seven day service standards are very specific to consultant um, input. That's not to say there's not lots of other workforce developments going on and alternative um, work um, streams, whether medical nursing or, or um, uh, roles like AC ACPs and ANPs and so on. But this this particular item is around consultant work. Um, 
so that that money was agreed and what's happened since then is um two things one is that um uh, covid kind of put a bit of spanner in the works in one sense in that it delayed a lot of the engagement work that we were doing around that where we were trying to win the hearts and minds of the consultants um who fundamentally um you know if you ask lots of people well do you fancy working on a saturday and sunday extra lots of people would say well no thank you um <clears throat> And then the second thing is it actually did um, change the way a lot of um, medics, nurses and, and everything as well, but medics as well worked at the weekend. So we went on to much more of a kind of seven day services model, both for junior and for senior doctors with much more involvement of consultants at the weekend. And that, and that did um, show uh, sort of significant benefits, I think, really from the point of view of um, things like length of stay um, and um, I think patient outcomes as well. One of the difficulties is it's terribly difficult to disentangle what was related to COVID and different ways of working um, and patient behaviour with COVID and what actually happened in, in um, what happened is different because of the way we were working. Um, that that uh, model of working with um, the consultants and so on coming in much more at the weekends that kind of isn't really wasn't really sustainable from the point of view of um, that being a kind of long-term solution the, the reasons for that is that um, during the covid peaks no one was allowed to do anything anyway because we we weren't allowed to go on holiday and you weren't allowed to go out and so on so people were less concerned about working weekends um, and but the additional thing was that people can often work really hard for a short term, a bit like we talked about critical care earlier, you can manage it for a short term, but if you're asked to do it as an indefinite thing, people do get get burnt out. So in um, April time, we went back onto the normal kind of um, rotors and reverted to doing um, the engagement work and the recruitment that was needed in order to progress seven day services in the kind of in the longer term in a more sustainable way. Um, and this this paper um, kind of highlights the work that's being done, um, the and then the timetable that we've drawn up from the point of view of um, actually implementing this in the hopefully relatively sh short to medium term. Um, I think um, Mansa has joined the call. I'm not sure if I can see him on my list, but um, Mansa is the divisional director of medicine, which is where a lot of this work um, is needed to be done. And, and he was going to just update and give a little bit more um, colour, I think, if he's here to particularly around the engagement work that's being done with the um, consultants. Man Mansa, are you on yeah. the call? So thank you, Hal. So just to add to what Hal has said, um, we made a conscious decision to rekindle these discussions. And so the project group that was 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 in place before COVID is, has now been um, resurrected. And we as a as divisional team have set up a, a project group to look at um, implementing with a view to trying to have something in place um, by the end of the year. Um, and that's our sort of stretch target if you like. What we have found is that the engagement work is, is taking up a lot of time in terms of persuasion and healthy discussions around the margins. And I think that the positive news, I would say, is that the, the bulk of our consultants are very supportive of moving to a seven days. So some of the challenges that we face, just to give you a little flavour, is that we've got some consultants who traditionally haven't worked at weekends, so that's requiring uh, an element of, of um, strong discussions and persuasions. The second element is that we're asking some of our clinicians to increase their frequency of work at weekends. So, for example, most consultants would expect some commitment on a one in eight basis, and we're asking them to, to move to a one in six. But having said that, there are lots of benefits that we could use to, to persuade um, and to influence. 
and then the modeling and, and uh, as Hal's alluded to we we had some sort of a model that was pre-covid um secure but i think that covid has taught us a lot that maybe if we had known what we know now we would have maybe modeled it slightly different but pivot towards this i think we'll be establishing the amu model because once amu is owning the front door seven days a week that will allow us to unlock some of the the consultant commitments to to steer them towards the seven days commitments and then the final aspect is that workforce wise um, if we look at the specialty work streams we have sufficient workforce in i would say 60 percent of our specialties but there are a couple of specialties where we are struggling with with workforce and workforce gaps and and i would say that cardiology and diabetes are the the two areas where we are having to sort of consider uh, alternative ways of working and, and my proposal is that we continue to sort of work towards some form of implementation and once we've had time to map out we could then look at what the gaps you know um, are in reality and then maybe we just need to address how we are going to provide that gap but it's 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 learning to be agile with a workforce that are struggling both physically and 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 I'm just starting to see a couple of consultants um, suffer with mental health issues as well so asking too much uh, and timing of it all is going to be vitally important as well so so we are making um, um, positive forward movement but it's it's slow but steady and I'm 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 reassured that we are moving forwards rather than backwards thank you man sir um, and, and I'm reassured that we're moving forwards rather than backwards as well. Um, the, the plan was always dependent on some recruitment in certain areas and, and Manchester men mentioned diabetes and cardiology, but there's also the acute medicine consultants where we, we've done well um, in recruiting to some of those posts, but the plan was always to recruit four consultants, which in the current national situation is a big ask. And we've recruited a couple, but we're, we're not um, completely there yet. Um, and I think we, we do need to be sensitive, you know, we talk about the workforce and not putting too much pressure on them and, and burning them out. And I think we need to be sensitive about that. But I think we have made um, significant progress, both in in practice and in, in hearts and minds. Um, so I'd, I'd pause there and um, ask if anyone has any any questions. Thank you very much, both Hal and Mansa. It's been a really helpful update and uh, we've got a much better sense of the kind of colour and context around some of the challenges of making seven day services a reality. Um, are there colleagues who want to comment? Berenice. Thanks Helen. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to both Hal and uh, Mansa. So, so it's it's OK kind of um, providing us the funding to go out and do the recruitment um, and, and actually say, great, we're, we're going to take seven day services on board. But it's a very different thing altogether to, to, to have discussions around changing job plans and actually moving people from the, the notorious doing Monday to Friday with some on call to actually be in there seven days a week. Um, and the massive work behind the scenes that both Mansa and Hal have actually done with our consultant colleagues um, in, in negotiating and having those discussions that moved them on a long way. So ju I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. And, and I, I should recognise the work that Cathy Butler's done alongside it as well, because she's sort of um, our, the finance um, partner within Medicine's taking this on as a, a kind of project to help with it. And she's she's been absolutely great with it as, as, as well. So I just wanted to men mention her work. I think that Mansa said that really struck a chord with me was about how you're cajoling and persuading and influencing your colleagues to move into the pattern. And you said, but we can show the benefits. And you weren't on the call, I don't think, Mansa, earlier when we had a fabulous, fabulous presentation about bringing data to bear and making this based patient centric decisions. Um, and I appreciate that seven day services over the kind of life that they've been around, which predates me, has become somewhat formulaic. You know, this sort of category of patient gets this sort of follow-up at this sort of frequency. 
And I just wonder as a kind of intermediate step between where we are now and where it is we're trying to get to, which of course may be beyond uh, compliance with those national uh, standards. I hope it is. Um, but whether or not we might be able to bring more data and information to bear to make more intelligent decisions about what's the optimal deployment of an already stretched workforce. Because, you know, that earlier presentation was all about kind of bringing our intelligence and experience and good judgment to bear on the basis of high quality data and an ability to manipulate it and use it. Um, so I just, I would, um, you know, commend that approach to you as part of this. But the other thing I'd say is we just can't give up on this. We can't give up on it. You know, uh, talking about having a pound for every time we discuss something, you know, we've all been talking about this since we were girls um, and boys, let alone men, men and women. Um, and it's just such a big prize, isn't it, in terms of the potential impact on clinical outcomes. You can't come to hospital on a Friday and malinger and malign in your bed until a Monday unless there are particular triggers for you needing to see somebody urgently. You know, it's something about, you know, wrapping around the patient, keeping that pathway flowing, um, but of course, recognising the pressure on an already stretched workforce. But I just think we can't give up on that ambition as a board because we will do a serious disservice to our patients. And the irony and the contrast will be even heightened and greater on the basis of the advances we're making on the quality agenda more broadly. So, I mean, if you've got asks, and I know you've had some asks and you've had the money and you've had plant consultants, but we can't knit them for you. But if you have other asks, you know, whatever they may be, as long as it's not illegal or moral or fattening, we will find a way to get it for you. You know, if you want three, four Michelin starred lunches on Saturday, if that's what it takes to kind of get it going, we shall, you know, um, I'm being flippant, uh, but I, 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 I raise the point for illustration. We need to do everything we can to help you make this a reality, and we will. And, and Helen, absolutely, we're not giving up on this. This is this is something that's going to happen. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I absolutely, the data thing is really um, vital, but it is really confused. You know, we've got really good data that shows length of stay was considerably shorter during the COVID period of time. But, you know, I, I, I could take all the credit and say that's because the consultants were coming in all the time at the weekends and discharging people faster. And there probably is a bit of that. But there was also a whole sea change in the way patients were managed from the point of view of getting people out of hospital and so on. So it is it is difficult to disentangle. Um, we are trying to one of the, the things the paper talks about is doing a kind of refresh of where we're up to with the current data regarding you know who gets seen at weekends so it's so kind of redoing the audit which hasn't been done for a little while and i think that'll help us i think we are also conscious of what can be done realistically and and um you know the the consultant contract as it stands at the moment consultants can refuse to work at weekends so there is kind of we do need to persuade people of it. We can't just kind of force people to do it. I think there may be some in the, the shorter term, some compromises in certain areas. So in some areas we may say, well, we're going to do six day working and you say, well, that's useless. We're meant to be doing seven day working, but six day working would be a lot better than five day working because then instead of having your two day gap where no one's seen, one day is a much more manageable gap. So there, there may be along the way, there may be um, some compromises about them, like you say, Helen, about the most effective use of the workforce we've got at the moment. Um, but I am confident we will get there to the finish line in the end. And just to add something more, Helen, just to add to, to what you said, I think that the bulk of the consultants recognise the benefits for patient care um, if they offer a specialist service at weekends. And I'm really determined that the more consultant presence we have at weekend, the better it is not just for patients, but it's also uh, benefits our staff and overall um, the flows through the system, because we all know that they are a valued part of the, the workforce, as is every member of the team that works at the weekend. So it, it, it's it's a healthy minority that we still have to, to work around, but the, the bulk of consultants are, are acceptant of the direction of travel. And well done you in terms of your leadership and all of that. 
if that comes to another thought and just to ask if you will be, I mean, I know we've made huge strides in recent years about um, the availability of pharmacists and physios and OTs and all sorts of other um, uh, parts of the workforce over the weekend. But I imagine if you're a consultant that's had to be cajoled into coming only to find out that there's some other bit of the path where you can't put the place with those other colleagues who are not there that makes your you know your job of persuasion harder so uh, perhaps we could ask you to make sure that that element uh, is also properly and fully developed and then you need to ask yeah yeah I, don't so, get, um, yeah I don't want to get Helen into trouble but I think how uttered in my ear the other day emotional blackmail <laughs> That was of the consultants, I should point out. But, but, but Helen, we, we are doing work with other workforce. So, for example, I'm doing something with Ali Braley, our new chief ph chief pharmacist, about making sure that we've got increased numbers of um, particularly prescribing pharmacists on the wards at the weekend. And part of the original seven day service plan was about an increase in junior doctor numbers to support those consultants at the weekend, because that's you're absolutely right. One of the biggest concerns of the consultants is they'll come in and they'll spend all the time um, you know, sort of doing prescribing themselves and doing discharge letters and things in a way that they don't feel is a an effective use of their, you know, their experience time. So, so it is all. Uh, there's lots of parallel bits of work going on as well, and, and including our ACPs and physicians associates, which I think will be part of that blended junior workforce as well. Very exciting and well done. Um, I wonder, Jay, could we make you the custodians of making sure that colleagues have everything they need that's not illegal or moral or fattening and uh, through the <laughs> oversight of the Quality Assurance Committee and them um, and feeling free to escalate it back to board as and when there's any decisions we need to make to really support colleagues in making this happen because it's a it's really important step to kind of move us on. So very well done. Thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you for making the time to join us, Mansu. Thank you. Thank you, Mansa. Can I make just a general comment? That's how I was probably going to make it at the end of the meeting. I won't work well, but I think it's quite pertinent now. During the course of the meeting, I've written two, I've written two things about clinician involvement in presentations to board and about how much we use our clinicians actually to come to board and connect to board. So the first instance, I think, is a really good example of something transformational and actually was really informative for us, but actually sees um, the policies and the strategies that we discuss actually come to life. I think it's really beneficial to all of us. But the second thing was listening to answer actually makes it very real in terms of thinking about the challenges. So I was just going to suggest that I wonder whether we might as well think a bit more broadly about when we do get clinicians to actually speak directly to us. And also, I was a little bit sad to hear one of the first clinicians almost apologise for having slides and taking our time. And again, I think as a board, we should be thinking about that because actually we do need to hear the voice, don't we, at board of our clinicians. And so that made me feel a little bit sad that they felt that they might need to apologise to us. And, and that's really not where we want to be, is it? So um, I'm sorry if I've it's a lovely point. observation um, I know it's been part of Angie's drive to bring yeah. the discussions we're having to life and um, again I think it's a sign of a, a, a maturing board isn't just that we are making space for all these um, voices and insights yeah. and um, if your if your comment is designed to encourage us to do more of it, Jane, yeah. I think it's well made. It's, it's about the colour isn't it, it's about the colour to the board's decision making that's really important. Now, can I ask Zoe, might we have a break from now to the quarter past 11 and then we will go straight to um, the um, apprenticeship paper? I think Maxine and Hayley joining us at 11.30, Helen, if that's OK. Well, in which case, we're going to have a break till the quarter past 11 and then we will go and do um, nursing establishment reviews between a quarter past and half past, if that's possible. And then we'll see um, Hayley and Maxine at half past. Thank you. Recharge your cups.
Someone sounding very sighing on the phone. Thank you very much for coming back so promptly. Um, hope your glasses are charged. Um, now I'm going to move on if we may please item 10. So Krishna, that's your nursing establishment review paper, please. Thank you very much, Helen. So um, there's sort of two papers here. So there's a nursing establishment review and then there's the um, maternity, say staffing sort of biannual report, which covers off one of the um, CNST, so the Clinton Negligence Scheme, um, sort of Safety Action 5. So they're quite comprehensive papers. Um, but we were just conscious that um, obviously as a board, we are sort of should really be receiving sort of the nursing and midwifery staffing on a, a six monthly basis. And obviously during COVID, it's been particularly difficult, I think, and very challenging to whilst we were assessing staffing on a daily basis from an operational point of view, and we've heard earlier today about flexing our staff to support you know, a lot of theatre staff and more teams supporting critical care. It's been quite difficult, I think, really, just to rebase. A number of our wards have changed numerous times. Um, one ward has, has moved five different areas during the whole of COVID sort of uh, period to now. Um, so what we have done, um, we've done sort of um, a base establishment review on a steady state, and we did that three months ago, and that was Sarah Ward who conducted that. And this sits within her portfolio. So we're really lucky, actually, she managed and successfully has been um, on the CNO sort of of England Safer Staffing Fellowship. So she's currently undertaking the um, modules for that um, for, the, for the rest of this year. She's doing really incredibly well, so we're learning a lot about sort of some of the rigour and the process. We're also learning uh, Chesterfield is ahead of the curve in, in, in many ways, which you'll be pleased to, to know. And, and some of that is down to sort of the process of what we've got in place. So we are assured on a daily basis from a staffing point of view about how we monitor the staffing and if there are any get gaps. We use um, the same sort of care tool, staffing care tool, which the wards do the acuity so they look at the numbers of staff are on duty the acuity of patients and if there's a gap then that get escalate that gets escalated throughout the division of teams and then we have a staffing meeting on a daily basis what's been particularly difficult so all our baseline indicators are really positive and this report in particular shows that the number of staff that we have one of the markers is how many contact hours per, per day do we do we manage to sort of support our patients with we've now had seen a real shift to we're in the upper quartile now nationally of the number of hours in contact time that we have with our patients that's a real positive for us um, we've seen a real sharp sort of increase we had um, 40 overseas nurses who came bless them at the beginning of the 
and midway through sort of last year in the pandemic. We've also got another 40 colleagues, international nurses that um, all been well, they're catching flights, a number of them sort of during this month. Um, we were expecting them in May, but obviously the, because our international nurses have come from India, their flights were obviously um, understandably put on hold. So we've got another 40 colleagues coming from India who are experienced nurses that we will support as we have done our other international nurses. We've also got in our pipeline, um, so Zoe's team, so Maxine and her team do a phenomenal job of interviewing and keeping on board our pipeline of nurses from new, newly qualified nurses. And we're expecting um, well into sort of the 60s, sort of about 66 at this moment in time, um, accepting offers here at Chesterfield and starting later in the year. So we've got a pipeline of nurses coming through which is phenomenally well. We also, you'll, you'll hear later after this presentation about pipeline of, of how we support our own staff. So I won't steal Maxine's uh, thunder for later. So we're in a really, really good position from a staffing point of view. However, it would be remiss of me to say that we are not, that, you know, that about not experiencing sort of operational challenges because we are, we're not alone. We've been on regional calls just to see how challenged it is. And that in many ways is, because many of our colleagues and you know, nursing is predominantly female. Um, maternity leave is, you know, our colleagues are, are leaving at 28 weeks as opposed to sort of another sort of eight weeks. So that's putting a, a strain on sort of that, that gap in time. Um, we've seen in the last sort of four or five weeks the um, input impact really of school and we, you know, about the being in bubbles and contacts so we've got a number of colleagues who who aren't here for a number of reasons which adds into it our underlying sickness levels are are really positive but with when you add in all of those gaps and we've still got um you know we've increased the footfall in our in our in our ed department which requires staffing we've got an sau that wasn't in you know hadn't wasn't in sort of um it wasn't a concept that we were used to until about sort of 18 months ago. So all of these are sort of new areas needing new staffing. All the teams have been through the rigour of, of what we're expecting sort of at our next establishment review to make sure that we've got the right staff and skill mix in the right areas. And during this last year, we've supported our colleagues with development. We've put in additional band six posts um, to support the leadership um, within the ward areas. We do know that we've put in a significant amount of new, we've had new matrons, our band seven posts, our senior leaders, and we're just starting, we're starting this month with that development um, programme to support our senior leaders. So we've got an awful lot of work. We met with um, Berenice and Claire Lambie from, sort of from an operational team to try and shore up an a, a, a improvement plan really from our staffing. So we know that we can, we've got the right number of people we know that we've got more people coming in we know that we, we've got developments and train but actually are we rostering us some of the basics have we got our rosters right you know have we got people in the right place at the right time and we have seen that we've done reviews sort of and um done some sort of evaluations really of some sometimes when we've been we've operationally pressurized have we got the right people in the right place and that's definitely an area of focus that we're moving forward with our improvement plan um, going forward. And that will form some of the basis from our um, senior leaders um, education and training as well. I think that, that for me was what I, all I really wanted to pick out of the, the staffing paper. I'm more than happy to take any questions on that before I sort of move on to the um, maternity paper. OK, let's pause there. Staffing papers. I think you want to add, Jane, from QAC perspective. And then just to say that we receive them regularly and that we're really pleased with the increase in, in care, care hours we looked at I think last year, but actually we were quite low on care hours, but actually <coughs> use the new tool and having looked at it, actually we're performing really very well. So I'll be very pleased to see that. Very good. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on that before we move on? Might I have one in that case, Krishna? Um, have we interrogated as fully as we might um, all the harms and any contribution or otherwise of staffing levels with respect to harms, whether they be falls or pressure ulcers or other patient harms? Um, I know that generally informs the assessment in the round. 
And I also appreciate we've invested heavily in nursing establishment and resources are finite. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take many anecdotal stories about the increase in the length of stay when a harm occurs that could potentially be avoided um, with more presence on wards to think, goodness me, are we really getting this right? Um, and I know you have a, a sense of that in the round, but some comment on that will be very welcome. So we're, we're, we are really lucky. I mean, we're, we're now supporting some more investment into our tissue viability team. But from our boys team, we've seen sort of um, the level of data in sort of in, interrogate, interrogation of that data. So when a fall occurs, it's it's down to um, the staffing on the ward. Um, it's a it's a quick review on what happened at that point in time, so you can easily sort of tell whether that was an issue or it wasn't. But for me, it's about the red flags. So we've got a system that we use to capture staffing data, and also if so before so we're preempting if 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 the potential for harm, if you like. In as much as so we've got a system that you can put on, if you are concerned, if you've got a full ward of patients and really high acuity, you may well be fine with the number of staff you've got on because you've got a rich skill mix, you've got additional students, and everything's fine. That's not a red flag. You could have half a ward of patients with a really poor skill mix and actually depleted numbers, and that potentially could be a red flag. So it's down to the professional judgment of the nurse in charge to identify if that might be a red flag. And then we use that uh, perspective to, to identify if there are areas that need to be shored up with additional staff from around different the wards, um, or we've got a pool of um, staff that we can deploy into that area if they're shown. So we're trying to preempt the harm occurring. So I think that's that is a positive. Are and then you, if, are you happy, Krishna, that people are using the red flag system well? And are you happy that we've got the overall resource to respond to red flags in a timely fashion without creating other risks elsewhere? I think that, I mean that forms part of our our sort of improvement plan and our education for how to use the red flags. Um because it's it's quite an art form if you're in the midst of a busy ward and you see that you've got a, a member of staff down to, to call and say that you're short without thinking about the com you know the complexities of the patients you've got and, and it might be that you're short of a nurse but actually it might be at this point in time with the with the staff that I've got on board I'm, I'm fine and it's using that professional judgment and that's sort of the, the training and sort of education that we need so we know that the red flags are being used are they being used to the full effect I don't feel they are at the moment, and that's that's the that's the rationale for that, um, that education and training for our ward leaders. Thank you for that clarification. Really helpful. Um, in which case, please move on to the um, midwifery issues, Krishna. So the midwifery issues. I mean, it's a it's a very comprehensive paper, but it did serve it did serve sort of the purpose of of shoring up and providing that significant assurance. Um, it identified where we'd. That we'd had our birth rate plus assessments. So our previous one in Chesterfield was 2016, and then we'd done a tabletop exercise in 2018. This was a full sort of notes review of, of the women in our care and based and looked at the acuity. And what it does show is that the acuity of the women sort of who are birthing with us has in increased. We've got higher acuity of women, but that is offset by a general national trend. Uh, COVID exception of reducing birth uh, numbers. So in most, in fact, in all hospitals, the number of births um, have, has been on a, a steady sort of reduction over the last sort of five years. I'm not sure that we understand the full effect of COVID and lockdown um, increase in birth numbers. And for us, the only sort of um, caution as well is that what we do know is in in um, other neighbouring trusts who have been in, under pressure from CQC, adverse CQC reports, we do know that, that it has resulted in women moving to um, different areas. And we've already seen sort of um, anecdotally at the moment, and we're working with Claire's team to identify a postcode movement of, of women booking in to see about that impact. But we've got Birth Rate Plus that came out in April that showed us that we are 
we've got a, a small deficit in our baseline establishments, but we've actually got more people in post than that because as an organisation we've we've supported sort of a couple for maternity leave. We're in a really, really positive place. I was in a regional call yesterday about some really challenged organisations with huge numbers of midwife deficits and we're not in that situation. And we've got people queuing to join us in September. On the paper, it does um, allude to the, sort of the NHS funding bid. I'm really pleased to say that we've, we got a confirmation yesterday of the Ockenden funding. So our request was sort of about 400,000 and we've been given 318,000, which in, in, the, in the round is, is really, really positive. That will sure up not just some of the maternity and midwifery workforce um, gaps, but it actually will help su support the medical workforce and strengthen that as well to, to allow um, the much needed time to be able to input into some of the safety metrics that we need to be able to assure a safe service. Well done, thank you, Krishna. Jane, can I just add a few things of thinking course. about the Maternity Safety Forum? Um, so one is just to confirm that the birth rate plus um, was really positive. And as Krishna said, we just need to think about where our staff are, whether we've got the staff, but whether they're always in the right place. So that's an ongoing conversation through the Safety Forum. And the second one was just to say that we're also looking at neonatal staffing because of some concerns raised about um, people acting and people's specialist skills versus um, unit leadership. So we're looking at that, and Krishna's got that as another tool that can be used. So that's a kind of quite a live issue at the moment, which I think is important to think about when you're thinking about maternity. And then I just wanted just to support what um, Krishna's just said about funding. So we have been successful in national funding and we are expecting to get some rebates on our CNST. But that does need to be used for the maternity for the things that we've identified. So um, I'm sure Lee will shoot me down here, but I'm sure that on the Joint Up Care Derbyshire slides, there was a, a, a line about maternity funding and limiting it to what of funding, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanted to be made clear that in order to support our safe service, we do need to keep those, those funding streams within maternity. Thank you, Jay, very helpful. Um, so thank you both for that um, assurance about uh, safe staff in maternity, very um, important and useful, like the Auckland, Auckland and recommendations. Um, does anybody want to come in on that or are you happy to uh, note and accept the assurances? Well done, Krishna. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, have Maxine and Hayley joined us? If you're on the call, say hello. Hi. Hi, welcome. Um, Hi. Have you with us? We're very excited um, to hear about uh, making best use of the apprenticeship levy. Um, we've been, it's been trailed and um, we know that there are great things happening and we're looking forward to hearing about it in a bit more detail. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say by way of introduction, Zoe. Thank you, Helen. And um, just to say, I did talk at board when the levy was first introduced in the first year, um, a few years ago now, and people committee have obviously been kept up to date since then. We thought it was really timely to bring the presentation today, um, both about the levy and the progress there, and also to touch on our more our broader growing our own agenda that um, Krishna mentioned too. So I'm really pleased to welcome Maxine, who many colleagues will know, and also Hayley. Warm welcome to Hayley, who's one of our apprentices. I'll hand over to you, Maxine. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, I, I think Liz Claridge might also uh, be, be on the, uh, the the call, but I'll uh, okay. I'll mention a bit of background to that uh, once we get going. Hello, now, here I am. I'm here. Oh, she's here. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, so that I can run through the uh, the presentation. So uh, 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 now I can't see you anymore. So has that worked? Uh, yes, but it's full screen. It's, yeah, it, it's full screen. All right. Great. If uh, can I ask somebody if uh, if it suddenly disappears, can, can someone let me know? <laughs> can you make it full screen, Maxine? Oh, right. I'm with you. Uh, slideshow. Um, from beginning. Right, how's that? 
That's good. Perfect. So uh, uh, thank you, first of all, for um, inviting us to come and uh, talk to you at the board about uh, growing our future workforce and making best use of the apprenticeship levy. Uh, I've also invited Liz Claridge to be on the call uh, because Liz really leads this agenda on behalf of myself and uh, the, the education team. So I thought it, it was good that Liz uh, was able to celebrate it in, uh, with us. And Hayley uh, is going to uh, talk for a few minutes later on during the presentation about her experience of being an apprentice and the opportunities that it's given her. So I'm going to um, try and whiz through uh, some of the slides because I, I, I think spending a bit of time listening to Hayley's story will, will be something that the board would be really interested in. So the, the way I've set out the, the presentation is uh, for, for those, I'm not making assumptions that people necessarily understand all about the apprenticeship levy. So I'm going to give a, a brief background to the levy, uh, then provide some information about where we are in relation to our spend against the levy, because that was one of the areas of concern when it first came out, and move on to you know, the achievements that we've made, that you know, the activity that we uh, undertake through the levy and the, what that's meant to us in terms of our apprenticeship numbers, uh, how we're actually you know, working in partnership with apprenticeship providers, uh, you know, other organisations and in particular the system around apprenticeships and the levy. Uh, and, and then that'll lead nicely in, I hope, to Hayley's story and then uh, wrap it up really with uh, where we are in terms of next steps. Uh, and uh, obviously uh, uh, any questions uh, if we have time, hopefully. So a bit of background to the levy. As Zoe uh, said, again, the, uh, she introduced it to the board when it first came in into place, which was now. Uh, April 2017, which is quite a long time ago now, and the levy is basically a, a, a tax on uh, employers who have a pay bill of more than three million pounds uh, per year, um, and that, that's only actually two percent of employers uh, nationally. Uh, in terms of the levy, uh, so each month, um, 0.5 percent of our uh, salary costs uh, get uh, paid into the levy. Uh, and that sits in what I think of as a levy bank account uh, for us that stays in there uh, for up to two years. And if we don't use it within that two years, uh, then the taxman then takes that away and that's used to fund uh, apprenticeships for non-levy paying organisations. Uh, we uh, so for us that's round about uh, 60k uh, per month. Um, uh, we, we pay uh, into the levy, um, and we're only able to use uh, that apprenticeship levy to actually pay for apprenticeship training. We can't use it to pay for salaries of people that we want to employ as apprentices. Uh, in addition to the uh, you know, 55, 60k a month that we uh, pay into the levy, uh, the, we, we also receive a 10% monthly top up uh, nationally into that. So we get a little bit extra on top of it. And we also get um, uh, some extra funding going into our levy for any individuals who we start on an apprenticeship who are uh, under 18, who are individuals, I think un, I think it's under 25 who are transitioning from care or other individuals who have um, you know, recognised uh, additional learning needs, we, we get additional funding on top of that. So, uh, so what does it mean in terms of money? Well, as you can see on the, the slide, you know, there, there's some quite big numbers here, especially from a, you know, a training and education point of view. And um, as you can see, the current funds that we have in our uh, apprenticeship at Levy part are you know, close to one and a half million. 
um, and the, uh, the amount of uh, funding that we've spent over the past 12 months is uh, ju just short of uh, 600,000. Um, and uh, the amount of funding that we're expected uh, to pay into the levy uh, over the next 12 months is there you can see you know, that's 778,000 and we're estimated to spend around about £650,000, uh, which is more than we'd spent in the previous uh, 12 months. Uh, we know this information through something called the uh, digital apprenticeship system. So that keeps a, uh, so that's our, uh, I think of it as our apprenticeship bank account. So that keeps a tally of all of the money that we've uh, you know, got sat uh, there in the levy. Uh, but that's also where the uh, funding is paid from. Uh, to the apprenticeship providers for uh, you know, apprenticeship training that we we commission. So this is really our uh, digital uh, bank account. So they keep a tally of how much we've got in in total and kind of give us a sense of uh, you know, uh, where we're, we're on track in terms of our spending. Now, if we don't spend um, the, the funding that's gone in, uh, then we uh, over a, a 24 month period, we potentially lose some of that funding. Uh, however, that I think really good news for us is that we've never um, had to give up any of our levy spend, which is a really good news story because uh, many organisations have not been in that same uh, position and haven't been able to keep on top of their uh, levy spend and have actually lost that money back back to the tax man. So I think that's you know, a, a really good achievement for us. Uh, in terms of uh, how we're actually you know, uh, utilising uh, our levy, you can see from uh, th this slide, um, if uh, where it says does uh, transaction areas, this shows in terms of the amount of levy that we're spending, uh, typically the areas that we're spending the majority of our funding on. And you'll see that um, healthcare at level, at level two and level three uh, apprenticeships, which is uh, uh, the main apprenticeship for our healthcare assistants, is our main uh, activity. Um, uh, that's in terms of cost. In terms of the numbers of people doing uh, apprenticeship, that's far greater, but it's a relatively inexpensive apprenticeship. So that costs about two and a half thousand pounds per individual for that apprenticeship. Whereas if we look at the 3%, uh, which is the advanced clinical practitioner uh, apprenticeship, uh, so uh, Although that's only 3% and there's only a small number of people doing it, that apprenticeship costs uh, £9,000. And then if we look at the leadership and management, which is 17% uh, of the, uh, the cost, again, you know, uh, we have increasing numbers of uh, people doing that, but it's relatively small compared to the, the healthcare assistants. Uh, but th that's a master's level uh, apprenticeship uh, that costs, um, you know, uh, uh, £21,000, £23,000. So whatever it would be the, uh, the the cost for a ma uh, master's apprenticeship. So you can just see how the, the, the actual, you know, that uh, £600,000 of spend during the year that I've just talked about, you can see how that's uh, spread out across the different uh, qualifications. In the uh, the bar graph um, uh, that says whole time equivalent in post, that's actually incorrect. It's not whole time equivalent. This is head count. So this should, just shows you the spread of you know, wh where we have those apprenticeships across the organisation. And not surprisingly, you know, uh, uh, medicine and emergency care um, have the largest number of apprenticeships and that will be mainly made up of the number of healthcare assistants that they have in that division undertaking the level two and level three. And the bottom bar graph uh, that shows our uh, the amount of funds we have 
uh, going into the levy each month and the amount that we have going out each month. Uh, th there's no rhyme or reason uh, to why some months we have massive amounts going out, such as in October 20, or uh, smaller amounts going out, such as in uh, March 21. It, it's all uh, around when the uh, uh, the colleges um, invoice to the, um, uh, the the apprenticeship system more than anything. But the general trend is, you can see. The, the amount of money that we're paying in stays pretty static, uh, but the, um, uh, the amount of funds that we're uh, using has gone from average £40,000 uh, per month in April 20 to from October 20 to the uh, current day, you know, we're spending around about £60,000 uh, a month, which means that we're really starting to make an impact on you know, the amount of levy that we're spending and making best use of our resources. So we're, um, so we're not only you know, putting lots of people uh, through this uh, training, um, you know, we're, we're having really good uh, outcomes for learning, learners as well. And uh, in the past 18 months, the uh, apprenticeships have changed and um, individuals now undertaking an apprenticeship have to do something at the end of the apprenticeship called an endpoint assessment. So this is the final hurdle that they have to uh, cross in order to you know, complete their qualification. And uh, uh, to date, we've had a 100% pass rate for our endpoint assessment and 65% of those individuals who've undertaken the endpoint assessment have achieved either a merit or a distinction and I think that that's just credit to the uh, quality of uh, you know, support and training that individuals get in practice as well as the academic. Uh, this uh, next slide uh, just highlights how we've been uh, working in partnership with uh, Joined Up Care Derbyshire and Joined Up Careers Derbyshire as part of our uh, integrated care system. Uh, apprenticeships are you know, a key part of our system uh, people strategy and the implementation plan associated uh, with that, which is called Growing for the Future Work Stream. Uh, and we uh, work closely uh, with Joined Up uh, careers to help support the development of apprenticeships across the system. Uh, we also um, work with the system in terms of uh, something called gifting. So, uh, as I've said, only 2% of employers actually pay into the, uh, the levy. And uh, that means that other employers, if they want uh, th their uh, individual staff to go on to an apprenticeship, they have to contribute towards the cost of that. So uh, what we can actually do is we can support uh, employers with that cost by us uh, paying for that apprenticeship for them. Uh, so for example, you know, um, you know, primary care, re residential homes, you know, uh, any you know, other um, you know, uh, body that uh, wants to undertake uh, apprenticeships, we can s support them by gifting up to 25% of our levy to those uh, other employers. And uh, these don't have to be healthcare pr providers, but you know, we've obviously focused on doing that. And uh, so far, we've you know, supported gifting uh, as an individual organisation and as a system. Uh, to support the development of uh, pharmacy technicians across the system because that's you know, uh, an area where we're struggling with that workforce and also to help uh, primary care to develop uh, nursing associates uh, in, uh, in their workforce as well. And that's uh, something that you know, over the coming year we want to look at how we can do more of that. One, because it's a good thing to do for the system Two, you know, it, it helps other people uh, to, to grow their workforce, but also for us, it means that we can make uh, you know, conscious decisions about how we are actively using our levy uh, rather than risk losing it if we don't spend it. 
so that's kind of some rationale around around that. Um, in terms of uh, working in partnership with uh, apprenticeship providers, our two biggest um, providers of apprenticeships are Sheffield College and the University of Derby. And um, we, uh, uh, we've developed um, uh, agreements with uh, both of those providers so that we, uh, we co-deliver those programmes. Uh, so that means that we're able to uh, draw back um, you know, part of that uh, apprenticeship cost back into the organisation and then we deliver uh, part of that programme on behalf of the college or the university. And you know the, the key advantages of that are it means that you know our people you know, don't have to travel uh, to other organisations to receive that training. You know we can deliver that for them here on site. It means that the uh, assessors that are supporting them get to know them as individuals. They know how we work as an organisation and what our values are. Um, and you know, we can you know, adapt the training programme so it's meaningful to us as an organisation. Um, what learners have said back to us is that they really value that, that makes a real difference uh, to them and how well they feel supported and the quality of uh, education they're receiving. And that income then allows us to reinvest in more educators in that team so we can support more apprentice learners. Uh, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. I think this just gives you a snapshot of the uh, the range of different programmes uh, that we have uh, learners on in, in the organisation and the range of different training providers and different levels of uh, training that we have uh, currently on offer. Uh, so currently uh, we have uh, 194 uh, apprenticeships that uh, started over the uh, the past year and that tends to be quite have uh, been quite consistent over the past three years now and uh, just before we move on to Hayley I, I just wanted to you know, highlight how you know uh, the apprenticeship levy and apprenticeships you know, uh, f fits in with you know looking after our people and supporting our communities and something that I'm personally quite passionate about, as is Liz, is you know this concept of get in. Um, you know, we, we were doing work on this well before you know uh, we started talking about anchor organisations, and you know this is about how we've been you know helping uh, unemployed people, in particular young people and. Uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds into employment with us in the organisation. So working with uh, bodies such as the Prince's Trust, uh, joined up careers, linking in with you know, step into work pre-employment programmes and most recently kickstart programmes. So this is really work experience opportunities for individuals which we're able to support as a team, which then lead them on into hopefully, well, go frequently uh, going into employment with us, uh, most often as a healthcare assistant or a healthcare assistant apprentice. Um, and then that moves them into this get on stage where we're then able to support our people who are working in support roles to move through a range of apprenticeships to become registered healthcare professionals. So moving from you know, healthcare support worker apprenticeships at level two and three, to then moving on to do their nursing associate apprenticeship or their assistant practitioner apprenticeship. And uh, now we're also able to offer that next step on to be a registered nurse apprenticeship or most recently to be a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, a radiographer. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, and um, we now also have the advanced clinical practice uh, apprenticeship. So there's a whole career span there in terms of you know, uh, getting on in their career in the organisation and the added benefit of 
we know that if people do an apprenticeship, they are more likely to be retained within the organisation where they've done that apprenticeship. And last but not least, uh, go further. Uh, so we have a range of uh, apprenticeship programmes now for aspiring leaders, uh, which uh, go from a, a level three uh, apprenticeship for you know, a team leader through to a level seven uh, master's apprenticeship. So I think that leads in nicely uh, to me to hand over to uh, Hayley, who um, I've said is, is going to provide us with an apprentice uh, star story. Um, so uh, um, Hayley, is that OK if I hand over to you? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's fine. fine. Thank you. Thank you. Hayley, just before you start, really looking forward to getting to you. I'm confident I've seen that we've had 20 minutes so far, and I'm really keen that we hear very fully from Hayley. So just to help me manage the rest of the agenda, it would be really helpful to know how much more time we're going to need. Uh, Hayley was going to uh, take about five minutes. My final slide is about 30, 30 seconds. So I, I think uh, I just wanted to make sure that we'd got enough time for uh, questions, in particular for Hayley, because I think that's what. Absolutely. That's really. Yeah. Thank you very much. All yours, Hayley. <laughs> Hi, yeah, so I'm Ailey. I'm 35 years old. I've got two children and I'll tell you about how I became an apprentice student nurse at 35. <laughs> so when I left school, I wanted to be a graphic designer. So I went to college. I did A-levels in graphic design and IT. I then went on to Sheffield University and I did a graphic design degree. Whilst I was there, I got a placement at like one of the most sought after design studios in Sheffield, if you like and they offered me a job. So after my degree, I went to work in my dream job, or so I thought. Um, and I'd, oh, I'd only been there a few months and I just started, I didn't enjoy it. I was thinking, why don't I like it? I, did, I didn't enjoy working in an office. I didn't like that I didn't really meet many people. I didn't want to sit at a computer all day. But because I'd done a degree, obviously, it took me a long time to get my degree. I felt like I should just enjoy it. So I, I stuck, at, stuck it out for about two years and then I just decided to leave. So I left my graphic design job and I did some freelance work. Around this time, me and my partner decided we wanted children. So along with my freelance work, I got a part time job in a travel shop and it was literally just doing like old people bus passes, disability bus passes, booking day trips. And while I was there, it's strange, but I just thought, I really like this job. I really like helping people. And then I had my son. Two years later, I had my daughter. And then I thought, well, what can I do now? I don't want to work in, in this shop and freelance for the rest of my life. So I thought, I want I want to be a nurse. <laughs> but I'd never, I'd never, I'd, I didn't have no healthcare experience. I'd never worked in healthcare. So I thought, before I dive into doing another degree to do another job that I don't like, I'll get a job as an healthcare assistant. So I remember having my interview at Chesterfield Royal um, with Claire Wells and she phoned me up a couple of weeks later and asked me if if I'd like a job and which ward I'd like to work on. And she, I remember she said I can either work on Robinson Ward, which is orthopaedic, or another ward. And I didn't I didn't even know what the word orthopaedic meant. So I just said, oh, I said, where do you work? And she was like, well, I'm matron on orthopaedic ward. So I was like, I'll go there then. <laughs> so I went. I did my essential training and then I remember on my first day, and if anyone knows Robinson Ward, sometimes it can be crazy. And on my first day, it was absolutely crazy. And I just thought, this is it. This is what I want to do. I love it. So then I did my um, MVQ level two whilst I was an healthcare assistant. And then around, I think it, maybe about 10 months later, I applied to Sheffield Allen University to do my nursing. Um, Claire, my matron, helped me do my personal statement. I went for the interview, I got on the course, and but I didn't really think about the funding. So when it came to the funding, because I'd done a previous degree, I couldn't get any student loans. Um, my partner's got quite a good job, so I, I, I couldn't get any bursary. And at this point, my children were two and four, so they were both at nursery. So obviously, a nursery cost a lot of money. I had a mortgage. It, it, and it was a lot of pressure on my partner to pay all that as well as support me through a degree as well. So even though I had a place at university, I just I couldn't do it, so I had to turn it down. 
so obviously I were a bit upset about <laughs> I were a bit upset about that. So then I started seeing posters around for the band four assistant practitioner degree. But I didn't realise because my previous degree was in graphic design and not healthcare, I didn't realise I could apply for it. And I remember it was near near the closing date and Claire once again got me in the office and said, Why haven't you applied for this band four? So I was like, Well, I didn't realise I couldn't. She went, Well, yeah, you can, she'll apply for it. So I applied for it. Um, I got on the course, so that involved me going to university one day a week and then spe- working on the ward for the rest of the time. Um, whilst I was on the course, I got the Dean's Award, which obviously I was proud that I got the Dean's Award, but what were really nice is I got a personalised letter from the head of nursing, so she like congratulated me. And then I got asked to do like a, like a YouTube video for apprentices for the Trust. So it was nice to feel like you were being recognised rather than just going to work and coming home kind of thing. Um, one of the assignments on my course was to implement a change on the ward. You could you could implement a change on the ward if you wanted to in real life or you could just make something up. So I decided because I work on Robinson and I know what it's like to work on there, I did um, like a fluid balance campaign. So I made all new posters for fluid balance put all patients like signs up behind the bed to make everyone aware they're on a fluid balance. It explained to relatives what a fluid balance was, had the measurements for every cup used on the ward. So just to make it easier to monitor the input and output of a patient, basically. Um, so that went down well. And then the author geriatrician really liked it. So that's actually been presented to the British Geriatric Society. And I think that we're three years ago now and it's still being used on board today so I think that's a good example of even though you're just a student if you like if you want to make a change you can and um, as well as that I also because of the fluid balance thing I used to work in the education centre one day a, a month just doing like posters and doing training and then I'd go on the ward and like for ne- neurovascular observations for example so then I'd go on the ward and do some training on the ward for that um, when the neck femur fracture nurse was away, I did some of her role as well, doing the NOF pro formers, making sure all that were still being done while she wasn't there. And then I think I'd been qualified maybe nearly two years and then the nursing apprenticeships come up. <laughs> so once again, that's where I am now. So now I'm on the nurse apprenticeship. I'm in my third year. I, I should qualify in March. Um, it's a full-time course, obviously because of COVID, it's been, most of it's been online. Um, every three months I meet up with Claire Langford and the university, have like a catch-up to make sure everything's all right. But I can email or ring them anytime I need to. Um, and that's it really, that's where I am. <laughs> what an inspiring, glorious. <laughs> fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I can breathe now. <laughs> you're proud and we're proud of you and it was thank you you mentioned in dispatches people who through their leadership have brought you on and um, i think you mentioned their wells once or twice um and you know the importance of that encouragement in the workplace to reach your full potential and um you know you will be the backbone of this um workforce and uh, place for years to come so that investment you've made in yourself will pay off so handsomely to the community for, I don't want to, I don't want to think you're enslaved, but decades <laughs> to come, which is uh, really rather wonderful. Um, and well done you. I'm sure there were moments where it required a great degree of bravery as well as uh, good judgment. So it's been lovely to hear um, Maxine's really helpful and comprehensive picture of our approach to apprenticeships brought to life in that way. Um, I'm very mindful, Maxine, not only of the fabulous use of funds you're achieving, but also the great outcomes for learners. And um, we recognise the amount of leadership required on your part to achieve that. It's not a story um, and other trust, and it's certainly not a story in other sectors. Um, so you have been working your magic, uh, for which we're duly grateful. Um, I'm going to go to Jeremy to see if there's anything you want to add from the perspective of the People Committee, Jeremy. Um, only that we keep a close eye on the on the apprenticeship levy and Maxine attends People Committee, as you know, and, and keeps us very much up to date with that. Um, and it's been very rewarding to see the way it's developed over the last couple of years. And 
Hayley's story is absolutely brilliant. Really good to see that in the flesh as well. So. Um, the gosh. Thinking about sending that to myself. <laughs> <laughs> no idea how I managed that. Um, we do have a hand up. I can't quite see it. Oh no, it's just a note. Sorry, it's not a hand. And my eyesight is failing me. I need stronger glass for it to do hybrid meetings at this distance. Um, I think it's nice to say a huge thank you from all of us. I think the applause um, um, gave you a sense of how it is you've made us feel and uh, we're really appreciative. And, uh, and of course, keep up the good work because this programme is here for uh, hopefully the foreseeable future. So thank you again. Um, very good. So we're now on to, if we may, um, we're on to item 11, which is the patient and staff experience report. And we have a duet from Krishna and Zoe. Uh, please take it away in whichever order you like. Thanks, Helen. I'll start from the um, staff experience perspective and then I'll hand over to Krishna. Um, so a few things I wanted to highlight from the paper. I feel like how am I going to follow Haley's story? That was fabulous. Thank you. Um, we talked earlier in the meeting about the thank you day on Monday, um, which the paper talks about, um, which coincided with the NHS's 73rd birthday, of course. So for us here, that was a day of celebration and we shared video messages and thank yous and lots of cake. Uh, it was also a day of reflection. Um, so with a two minute silence and throughout the day, really. So a bit of a mixture of emotions, mixture of emotions on one day. The paper also talks about the new NHS People Pulse survey, um, which is now live. So this is a new quarterly survey um, that we will be running as a trust. We did run it for a period during the pandemic last year as well. So it's not totally new to us, um, but this is the one we're we'll doing quarterly now, apart from when we do the annual staff survey. So it's live throughout the month of July and then we'll hopefully get our results in August. So it's a much shorter survey than the annual one um, with a much quicker turnaround focused on a number of key questions around advocacy, motivation, involvement, et cetera, as well as some questions about the impact of the pandemic on individuals, um, sort of two different aspects to that. So we'll look forward to seeing, seeing how that goes and how that becomes embedded. And the final thing I was going to talk about was the um, our exec sponsor roles. So the activities described in the paper are our first ones with our new list of priority teams um, for all of us. So there's a mixture of, for some of us, we've got some new teams. Um, for others, we've got some ones that we already have relationships with or a, a mixture of both. Um, so the paper sort of brings to life lots of examples. So for example, um, I've been involved in some staff survey feedback sessions and listening sessions. There's lots of other examples of um, execs, how they've introduced themselves to their new areas and met with leaders and met with teams, walkabouts and visits and really learning more about the services and understanding what's going on in the areas. And I will leave it there and hand over to you, Krishna, please. Thank you, Zoe. So I just wanted just to draw out a, a couple of things, really, just some celebrations, I think, really, from a, a number of our, our teams. So um, the first one really is about the improving cancer survivorship in the deaf community. So that's a lead nurse, that's Maria Ledbetter, Cherie Paul and Don Warrington, um, published online. But it was really they, they saw a, a gap, really, for um, difficulties with um, from our deaf community having access to uh, valuable information um, and they've developed a survivorship sort of information event for um, complete with um, really well supported with interpreters. Um, the article is, is sort of um, being peer reviewed in, in the peer review journal for sort of cancer nursing practice. So that's a really, really good sort of advocate for um, a, a really difficult situation, but a vulnerable group and being able to support uh, deaf community. Um, I think we mentioned it somewhere before as well, but the Trust um, the Royal College of Nursing Awards have sort of got um, from a carer's volunteer and um, carer liaison, so that's Rebecca and Carolyn, um, shortlisted for the RCN Commitment to Carers category, which is a real accolade for the, all the hard work that they've, they've put in. And the other one is that I wanted to draw out is the emergency department sometimes gets under scrutiny for, for different reasons, but I just wanted to draw out a real positive. We can't share, we've got embargoed um, feedback at the moment from friends and family um, from the picker feedback, but it is really positive. It's all I can say, I can't share any more than that. 
However, one of the things that they've, they've been in touch with is really that they want to come and do some and showcase the work, some real case, case sort of um, work with us to be able to sh showcase some of the improvements that they've done with the friends and family scores. We've just seen a, a, just a, a steady improvement since February last year of, of our scores. And actually it's a real, real sort of um, accolade a real, in, a, in a very pressurised area but a, a real sort of a bonus for, for us at Chesterfield that we've got such really good feedback. Before you conclude, Krishna, um, and I appreciate it will be somewhat off script, you might just give us um, a heads up on the glint in your eye about some of the improvement work around real-time patient feedback. So the glint in yes, so this will start with and, and we've, start, we've started this month actually, so we've had really good engagement from um, the divisions and we're starting with integrated care to do some more um, focus work on complaint responses. And this is, is, this is about um, equipping our leaders really with trying to be proactive in understanding what a complaint is and the perspective from that individual and how it is how how it would land if the, the response that they do but this is about having local resolution so if you equip your leaders with understanding it from the patients and the and the um, carers perspective that will equip us to be able to deal with things on a local level so if any of us have, have been in this this situation of complaining about whatever it is you want somebody to be receptive to your needs you want them to do it timely you want it to do with a real sense that they've listened to what you've said and that's exactly the same for our um, patients and carers and that local resolution that timely resolution is what we're trying to um, support our leaders in being able to do there is a system out there that will allow that to translate it into if there is a, a query or question that our um, patients or families have got We'll be able to put them in touch and our leaders will be equipped to be able to do that local resolution in a really timely but sensitive way and it's marrying those two two things up at the right time so what we don't want to do is to launch something that our leaders perhaps aren't equipped to be able to do so we're working with integrated care system first we've got some of the meetings with with medicine surgery are, are already on board with it and we've got training throughout July and August to be able to equip our leaders with, with, with those sort of skills. Well done, that's super, thank you. Any questions or comments um, for either Zoe or for Krishna or are people content to just be updated? Very many thanks. Um, that brings us to item 12, um, both three fight paper. Um, and this um, this indicates a change of uh, existing policy uh, on the back of um, recommendations from the hospital leadership team. I don't know, are you two taking this out? Uh, how, 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 all yours. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, so um, this paper is on the back of long-standing difficulties we've had around um, our hospital site regarding effective enforcement of the site being a smoke free site. Um, there's national um, directives um, which state that, that all NHS um, sites and grounds ought to be smoke, smoke free. Um, some of those um, target dates have already been and gone and we along with other um, um, organisations have struggled with effectively implementing a site being smoke free. So we can say we want to be smoke free and put up signs, but the there's a fundamental difficulty in that um, patients and visitors don't always comply with that. Um, that um, situation is exacerbated by the fact that there is actually no law against smoking outside the hospital building. So there's a, a law which can be legally enforced regarding smoking inside buildings, but there isn't anything at all about smoking outside the front entrance, for example. And um, my feeling to an extent is that until the, the national legal situation changes, it will be very difficult to enforce something that isn't legally enforceable. We, we've discussed with, um, uh, you know, the, the Derbyshire um, social services and, and the police services, and the, the only 
way they can suggest that you can do it is you could find people for littering if you drop cigarette butts, um, but you can't do anything about the actual smoking. So that's the background and the backgrounds of one of us as a hospital wanting to be um, smoke free for many years and trying to implement that and doing all the things around smoking advice and posters and TANO announcements and, and encouraging people. Um, but the truth is it, it wasn't really working. Um, that causes problems in various ways, but including the fact that um, it's very unsightly. It's not a good sort of advert for the health of the nation when people are coming in through one of the entrances and people are smoking. But there's also issues, I think, um, regarding protecting our own staff. So some of the places where people smoke, so for example, in the um, back courtyard by the, the what we call the, go the um, goldfish bowl, um, people often congregate at those doors um, smoke. There's offices that are just alongside that where um, there's a constant smell of cigarette smoke. Um, so based on all of that, we had a big conversation um, with um, staff, patients, governors, um, um, all invited and all contributed. Um, and the conclusion of that big conversation in the end was that that whilst we all aspired to a completely smoke free site, we didn't think it was working. We felt that something needed to be done because in the end we weren't getting anywhere, just playing the same, doing the same record again and again. Um, the um, absolutely we think we need to continue to encourage people to stop smoking. Um, we need to um, give support and advice. We need to make um, smoking um, nicotine replacement products available. Um, there was a feeling that we need to be a bit stricter sometimes about enforcing um, by line managers with appropriate support and training the fact that all of our staff should not be smoking on site. And, and that bit we can enforce because we have a, um, a, a staff um, I can't remember the name of it, but, but a, a policy regarding what's allowed in the grounds as well as within the hospital. And we can say for our staff that they're not allowed to smoke and we need to enforce that robustly. But the really controversial bit in the end, the conclusion of the um, big conversation was that as a pilot, we, we need to, we suggest that we offer three strategically um, placed um, smoking shelters where that they are away from the entrances and away from potentially our staff members being um, having to passively smoke and the risks involved with that but where we can direct people in a way that it, it manages the problem so that people aren't smoking outside the front door but they're smoking um, a distance away in a way that isn't kind of easily um, seen because if it's going to happen we'd rather it was hidden away rather than um, in full sight of everyone coming onto site. So that's the controversial bit of this proposal. It has, it did come out of that that engagement session, which which actually was just before COVID and then COVID's delayed all of this coming back. Um, it's been discussed at HLT on a couple of occasions. There are some relatively small costs to this, including the initial purchase of the shelters, which is about 25 purchase and, and um, putting in of the, the shelters, which is about 25,000. And then there's a recurrent um, cleaning cost for the shelters because we don't want it to all look, you know, horrible and dirty and covered with fag ends. Um, but the, our proposal is that we should pilot this because it's not working as it is. Um, I should say as a declaration of interests, I'm not a smoker. I never have been a smoker. I have no interest personally in using the shelters, but I think this, my, my suggestion is that this is the least bad option it's not something we want, but it's a least bad option. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and um, uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Hal. Um, I, I am not a smoker either, but I am absolutely delighted with this pragmatic approach for patients and visitors. And I think it's long overdue. Um, I'm going to come to colleagues, but I'm going to put you on notice that I have a bit of a challenge the proposal that I will return to when others have spoken. Jeremy. OK, thank, thank you, Hal, and thank you for this. I, I think I accept it as the least worst option. Uh, I appreciate there's a long history of all of this. Just a couple of questions. One is um, you, you said these about the shelters. 
one question is where precisely do you think they would be? I mean, the, the grounds are big. Is it going to be just outside the entrance, 50 yards away, 100 yards away, what, whatever? You also mentioned that it, this would be as a pilot. And so the question then rises, so how long for and how would it be evaluated? Um, and is it, you know, or is it something that's essentially going to be indefinite for the time being? And then just as a comment, in the paper, there's a line that said CAMS clinicians stated that a smoking area was essential for young people in distress. I have to say I was really disappointed to read that because there's been a long um, history of mental health professionals seeking to exceptionalise people with mental ill health in terms of smoking cessation. And the impact of that is simply that they get disadvantaged and people with mental illness not only have mental illness, but they have all the physical illnesses arise from being smoking addicts as well. So I, that's just by way of comment, really. I, but I, you know, I understand why they say that, but I was really disappointed to read that. And with regard to two questions around the implementation, we put colleagues on notice of that, and it comes back as part of the progress update, and I'm sure it'll be part of the wider site uh, strategy too. So uh, colleagues might like a time to think about that, if that's all right. Um, anybody else want to come in on this? Beverly? I, I just think it's a really pragmatic solution to a perennial problem. My, my only comment would be we have to manage this with council of governors because it's exercised them for some time, but I agree, we've got to do something. What we're doing now is just incredible. Absolutely. In which case, I'm going to put my challenge on the table. Um, yeah, did, did you want me to just answer Jeremy's questions? Just um, to take them on notice and we'll have um, a re we'll have a response by way of the implementation update. Right. Thank you. Um, the challenge is I'm not convinced we've landed in the right place around the star. Um, I appreciate we can insist on a zero tolerance approach, and I understand that people who smoke might be healthier if they're not allowed to smoke for the duration of their time at work, including their breaks. Um, uh, the libertarian in me says is getting perilously close to an infringement of their human rights. They're intelligent people, they understand the risks. Um, it is not an illegal product, it's not illegal to smoke outside, and are we right in insisting that our um, employment policies override, override those other rights they've got? Now, I'm not suggesting we have a debate about it now, um, but I am rather pleased that we have taken what I believe is a, step, a pragmatic step in the right direction, but I would also ask that we put you on note that we'd like you to have a think about that as you uh, perhaps um, build the experience of this um, pilot approach for uh, patients and visitors. And it says that publish on Monday, so very time that we can have that conversation then. Very good. Yeah, and I think also there's a statement about the disciplinary process, which fits with that as well, because I'm uh, reading what I read, I wasn't clear what position would be with the staff, and it said it was down to disciplinary process and senior managers, I think we really have to really know what that means. Yeah, we'll take all of that together then. But uh, well done, Hal. We've gone where angels fear to tread. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think the challenge may be with the governors going. <laughs> well. um, because there's, there, there's all like car parking, there's always very strong feelings about smoking on site. And I'm, I'm conscious that it, it, it they may not all be so pragmatic it, in the, in the way that I think sensibly we are being. Well, it's been it's been a very well considered decision in the light of experience of doing something else. So we shall do our best to explain it and to take their further views on matters. And um, so that brings us to the end of the agenda, but it doesn't really because we need to go back now, if we may, up to item four. Um, and item four is where we get the reports from each committee chairs, um, anything you want to escalate to board, and in particular anything you want to escalate to board around the integrated performance report, and then perhaps to add you for an overview about what that may or may not mean in terms of the board assurance framework. And um, you will see that we're pressed for time. So anything that's a narrative as opposed to a matter that needs to be escalated to board, I'd be grateful if we could take outside the meeting, but obviously we want to hear it. Um, 
uh, material or significant items that need uh, bringing to our attention now. So I'm going to start with your job agenda. Go to you, Jane, please, for quack. OK, thank you. So um, great synergy, I think, with the items that we've discussed this morning already. Um, so in terms of patient harms, in terms of staffing, et cetera, um, two I just probably wanted to just draw to your attention were that we still don't have the key metrics on maternity into the IPR. I don't know whether we will um, have them in the next one, but it's been a matter of they've had to be agreed through the system as well. So it's it's not our slowness. It's actually a process of agreement, but I'm very hopeful that we see them soon because clearly that's what we want. And second thing was just to point out as well around some KPIs for stroke. Um, but we're expecting to see those as well in, in July as we move from monitoring the action plan to um, KPIs. Sorry, there was a third thing which was about um, outcomes for our patients around um, COVID. You know, we did a big piece of work, and um, I believe we're going to have further discussion on that in September. Thank you very much. The board, sorry, Helen, the board. Okay, very good. Um, we won't pause after each item, we'll pause after all the committees if we may. Um, Mike, please. Uh, hi, we had a, uh, a standard year-end audit committee on the 27th of May. Four points to bring to the board's attention. Firstly, we got significant insurance, sorry, significant assurance from our head of internal audit opinion for both the BAP and the risk management, which was gratifying. Uh, we need to improve on our follow-up of internal audits, but the exec team were all over that. Uh, we had a very, very strong report from KPMG, our external auditors, who aren't easily pleased, but gave us a glowing report on the external audit, particularly around our value for money work, which was uh, made us one of the very few hospitals in the country with such a glowing report. Uh, and we also had an update on the process for the external auditors, if KPMG do indeed step down, but I think that's still in abeyance. And again, it's just worth pointing out that the finance team have done an incredibly good job, as always, in getting a very clean audit approved by a very challenging set of external and internal <laughs> auditors to time and at a very high quality. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, has there been a meeting of the Oversight Committee for DFS, uh, DSFS in the period or not? I don't think there has, no. No. OK, that's super. In which case, we'll move on to Alison for finance and performance, please. Uh, thanks, Helen. Um, so four different areas to talk about for me. Um, so the first one is around performance um, and Berenice might want to come in at the end of the updates to, to give us more of a, a conversation about Urgent Care Village. Um, but F&P reviewed that um, and where we are on the investment plan and moving things forward. Um, we also had a good conversation about restoration and recovery and some of the issues that we're facing around theatres. And I would just echo um, Angie's comments from right at the beginning of this meeting um, that um, some memories seem to be quite short around the pressures that we've been facing through the pandemic. And as a board, I think we just need to um, support our executive colleagues in the conversations about restoration and recovery and, um, and ensuring that our staff are in a good place to be able to do what we need them to do. Um, so Berenice might want to add something at the end. From a finance point of view, um, we had a conversation about um, funding and currently at the moment performance is fine from a finance point of view. Um, the arrangements for the second half of the year are still not clear, although the mood music is around extension of the current COVID arrangements. And we also had a conversation around capital um, and the general shortage of capital and the impact on our buildings that the pandemic has had has had, again, um, Lee might want to come and comment at the end. We also covered two other items, um, procurement paper, which is appended to the, the board's papers this month. Um, and we reviewed the procurement strategy. Um, and thanks to uh, Zoe for coming and attending the meeting where we tied together the processes around financial planning, operational performance and our HR planning processes. Um, in terms of the BAF, we did have a conversation about do we need to increase the risk scores for the two risks that the committee looks after. Um, and we decided that there's a growing uncertainty around the financial position until the second half of the year is clarified. And even then, there's an imperative around cost saving um, for the end of this year and the run rate into next year. Um, and because of the uh, pressures on restoration and recovery, and the unknown of COVID next steps, 
we were also concerned around the uh, performance risk. Um, but we decided not to increase the scores or not to recommend to increase the scores, but to add some additional commentary um, about the um, uncertainty of those two risks at the moment. So um, I'll leave you to invite Berenice or Lee to comment at the end, Helen, as you see fit. Thank you, Alison. Is there anything that Berenice or Lee would just to add while well, this report? Thanks, Helen. I, I just what I agreed to do, just so the board was um, cited, was just to highlight around the urgent and emergency care development, really positive, making good progress and enabling works have started. Needed to highlight that there may be some risk in the timelines due to access to materials, um, due, due to kind of delays with building materials coming through with COVID and Brexit. And the other point just to highlight to the to the board is around we have agreed the um, expansion of the first floor. However, the additional staffing area will not be part of the GMP that we're expecting to come back formally in September. We will do that as a as a board and we'll work, work through that with the uh, same providers and same procurement. Um, and with regards to the, the recovery and restoration, it would be remiss of us not to highlight to the to the board just around the pressures we are absolutely having around our theatre staff. And uh, we have a number of staff, 16 staff that are on long term sick that we we've heard already around the health and well-being support that's being put in place. Um, and that you know we've also heard around the the staff and paper there's real interrogation on making improvements around that but it is undoubtedly impacting on the amount of theatres that we're able to have open at, the t at this time. Really pleased to see the finance and performance team um, at committee meetings supported us with uh, the actions that were taken and understood the uh, challenges that we're having. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Thank you all very much for those updates. Can I just pause before I go to Angie for back to see if there's questions and anything you've heard by way of uh, assurance committee reports? No, in which case I'll pass to Angie, please, for any further observations on the back. Uh, just to uh, remind everyone that the new format now um, is more or less perfected. Uh, we had, a, a, as Alison said, a really good discussion at FMP. Um, around what risk appetite, tolerability, mitigations. So um, really uh, good to see that come to life. Um, we said we'd tweak, as Alison said, some of the uh, detail. Uh, the ball's been set now for people committee next week and crack the week after. Um, and any other comments that you want to give on um, strategic risk four, which um, Jane ratted back to us and gave to board uh, for now. So I've done my best to reflect where we're at. And really helpful conversations today. I think that if you're comfortable, Helen, I'll do a bit more work on that one and circulate that ready for next board meeting. Perfect, perfect. Um, colleagues content to note that. Uh, really good progress. Right. Um, in which case, that brings us to the end of the meeting. And as uh, you'll all know, we normally pause to uh, reflect on how it is we did. Um, I'd like to give that opportunity today to reflect on the meeting and as widely as they wish to Beverly, to Alison and to Sarah um, on the basis that uh, we would uh, really welcome that. And so you can uh, have a shorter term or as longer term uh, a set of observations as you wish, but uh, uh, please, please do. Sarah, can I ask you to go first and then I'll come to Beverly and Alison. We can. Um, I think I obviously i've been at the royal a long a long time a long long time um and i think i have to say to to finish on that board meeting um i feel that i've finished on a high um i actually um i found the story from Helen quite emotional um in terms of um what the trust offers um to its people nowadays and um the patient story i'd spoken to the family um, earlier this year um, and I think even seeing it for that second and third time and hearing about it um, just brings home what, um, what sort of organisation Chesterfield Royal is and I'll finish there because my voice is bobbling. <laughs> um, I suppose the thing that stands out for me the most over time is, is the massive strides 
made in suffocation. It is a completely different place to work. Leadership from the top, obviously. And as, as one thing I love doing is the wall visits, and we employ some fantastic people. And what a great example Maxine was. For, for the powers that be to impose a policy like the apprenticeship scheme is not difficult to introduce, but we've got such great people. And I think as the board, we've set a good culture. Something to be proud of. Thanks, Beverly. And Alison. Uh, thanks, Helen. Um, I think it's appropriate to, to reflect on the nine years, really, for me, and the difference that we have now in board meetings to when I first joined, um, and the level of discussion and the level of interaction that we have in, in working as a complete team to move the hospital performs forward. And, and um, as I would always do when I'm out and about, if people say they've been to the hospital, I always ask them how it was. Um, and uh, certainly when I first started nine years ago, there was always some commentary that was slightly uh, concerning. Whereas now, whenever I ask people in the public, um, the praise is just um, just always there. So it's for me, it's a real reflection of how the board has moved forward, how the hospital has moved forward and the ability of a board to make it to make a difference over the longer term um, is uh, is just absolutely illustrated.